So we're um, about to get proceedings underway again. Can I just, for the benefit of members, uh, members of uh, staff here, also here in the room with us this afternoon, I ask you to bear in mind that the um, mayor's tea dance will be starting again next door at around about two o'clock or so. So, if anyone um, needs to leave the room, can I make the request that you do so through um, the um, the visitors' gallery doors? Because when those two doors swing open, obviously that noise can can drown out the conversations. Um, so through the visitors gallery, um, uh, that usually keeps the noise in. So just bear that in mind if you do have to uh, leave for any uh, particular reason. Of course, um, in the event of an emergency, leave through the usual emergency exits. But um, I'm sure everybody will understand that. So uh, again, um, welcome everybody. Welcome to members here um, in the chamber. Welcome to our elected uh, representatives who joined us online for uh, this meeting. And also me uh, welcome to members of the public who have joined us, uh, agents, applicants. Um, so we have quite um, a, a heavy agenda ahead. And so therefore I don't intend on delaying proceedings any more. Uh, so I am going to um, ask the Head of Planning, Warren Fox, to uh, read out a notice and summons of meeting and uh, move to item two, members' attendance and apologies. Thank you, Chair. Members, you are hereby summoned to attend the monthly meeting of the Planning Committee, which will be a hybrid socially distanced meeting to be conducted remotely via web WebEx and also physically in the Chamber on Wednesday the 7th of September 2022. Alderman Alan Breslin. Here, Mara. Thank you, Alan. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Here, Mara. Thanks, Keith. Alderman Drew Thompson. Here, Mara. Thanks, Drew. Councillor Jason Barr has sent his apologies. Councillor Raymond Barr. Here, Mara. Thanks, Raymond. Councillor Angela Dobbins. Councillor Angela Dobbins. Uh, hi, Maura, yes. Thanks, Angela. Councillor Paul Gallagher. That's all. Thank you, Paul. Councillor Christopher Jackson. That's all. Thank you, Christopher. Councillor Dan Kelly. He's going to be late, Maura. Okay, no problem. Councillor Patricia Logue. <coughs> Thank you, Patricia. Councillor Kieran McGuire. Yeah, here. Thank, thank you, Kieran. Councillor Philip McKinney. Here. Chamber, thank you. And Councillor Sean Mooney. Here. Thanks, Sean. Wonder why you've missed. Sorry, Sean. Councillor John Boyle. I am here, but I think that was probably fairly obvious, sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> but just for the record, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Maura. Thank you, members. Um, uh, so I'm just going to do uh, the formalities of the broadcast statement um, as we get started. So I'd like to remind everybody present at this meeting in the Guildhall or in attendance remotely that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of repeated viewing. This broadcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with our protocol. Due to your attendance at this meeting, you are consenting to being filmed and to the use and storage of those images for broadcasting or training purposes and for the purpose of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. Members and approved speakers are reminded to only have your microphones and cameras on whilst speaking at the meeting and to use the chat facility to highlight a request to speak. A copy of the Council's privacy notice may be found on the Council website. Members, moving on to item number four on the agenda, and that's declarations of members' interest. Um, you can um, clearly verbalise those uh, declarations either now um, or uh, through the course of the meeting. Um, uh, so uh, I'll invite uh, anyone that wants to make a declaration now to do so. Okay, thank you, members. Um, and so, um, again, we're moving into um, uh, the opening of decisions, members. Uh, item number five on your agenda, of course, is as usual, chairperson's business. I don't have any uh, personal chairperson's business that I wish to reflect upon today. 
However, as is normal um, and as, as our usual practice, I'm going to pass over to uh, the head of planning who's going to work us through uh, some late items, etc. So again, Maura, I'll pass back to yourself. Thank you, Chair. Members, we have a number of late items which you will have received over the last few days um, via the administrative officer. Um, I'll just run through those just to make sure and link them through with the items. And Chair is suggesting we cover these um, these uh, per item um, in advance in terms of timing uh, um, when each item emerges on the on the schedule. Item one, we have um, an email from the agent, and that's dated the fifth of September two thousand and twenty-two. Members, you will see the the letter that was submitted in regard to this particular item. And we've also had a submission of uh, a revised um, suite of drawings and plans in regards to this um, proposal. So um, officers will be required to reconsult, uh, re-notify and, and carry out all the due processes again. So um, unfortunately, I'm recommending the committee that we would need to defer this application on the basis of the revised submission that we've just received on the 5th and the 6th of September. So just want members to note that. Um, in terms of item three, um, we've received a number of different um, documents. Um, we've received an email from Thomas Buchanan, MLA, and that's dated the 1st of September. We received a statement from Robert Brown, the objector, and that was received on the 6th of September. We received a copy of the letter to um, Councillor McKinney, and that's dated the 8th of June, and that should be in your, your documents. Copies of letters to um, Suzanne McCracken, dated the 1st of August and the 6th of September. And response to planning committee um, and report dated the 2nd of June. That's the response that was received from Carson McDowell, and that was on the 6th of September. So remember, there's there's quite a considerable amount there, and um, the chair will run through how we, we're going to manage that um, in due course. On item six, um, we've received um, information from the agent, and that was received on the 5th of September 2022. On item eight, we've received a number of, of pieces of documentation. We have an email from Mr. McAteer, the applicant, and that was received on the 1st of September. We've also got notes from Mr. McAteer received on the 5th of September, speaking notes, and that has been submitted as a late item. We have an email from Garrett and Myra Duffy. Um, those are our objectors received on the 7th of September. So that's item eight, members. Moving on to item 10. And this, we have received some information, photographs from the agent Andy Tate on behalf of objectors, and that was received on the 2nd of September, 2022. Um, officers have considered that information is obviously only recently submitted. And we're of the view that we need to um, take some of the information on board and reconsult um, SES in regard to this in order just to ensure that um, details are correct. So on this occasion, Chair and the committee, I would recommend that we defer this application for officers to, to go through that consultation process before we would consider making a decision on that. So that's that's it, Chair. That's me run through the late items. Sorry, um, Councillor Luke, that's item 10. Item 10. Okay, is that okay, Chair? Thank you. Thank you, Maura. Um, and me members, as alluded to uh, by Maura there, uh, uh, bearing in mind the voluminous um, amount of, of late information that, that came your way over the last 24, 48 hours, um, I proposed a change how we would perhaps normally uh, tackle 
uh, that amount of information, usually at the beginning of planning committee, uh, the chair would invite everybody to read through all of the late items in the one go. Um, I'm going to try this a different way today because of, of, of the, the amount of information that you have. So I'm proposing um, for your benefit, really, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to operate on the basis of with each application that has a late item, I will then draw out that late item uh, and invite you then at that point before we hear that application to read through that those particular elements of the late item. Um, it might take a little bit longer, I'm not sure. Um, it's really over to yourselves as to how long you take to read your way through stuff and how satisfied you are that you understand it. But I think that's the only way we can proceed today, as I said, given the, the amount of information that you were given. Um, uh, and that there can then be no confusion um, uh, in relation to something that you might have read about one application, then you read another one, then you read another one. I think you all get where I'm coming from. So that's how we're going to do it, and hopefully that'll work. Um, and so uh, then that brings us to the next part of how we're going to work through this, and, and, and evidently the running order. Um, so the running order for the next uh, day or two uh, will be as follows. Uh, beginning with item two, three, five, six, seven, eleven, four, nine, and eight. So two, three, five, six, seven, eleven, four, nine, and eight. Okay, thank you, Cursor. Okay, members. So, assuming everybody got that piece of information, I'm going to move on next item in the agenda, uh, item six. Um, uh, and you ask uh, uh, all of you if there are any matters arising from the open minutes of the planning committee meeting, which was held on Wednesday, the 6th of July. Okay, members, we'll move on from that. And are there any matters arising from the open minutes of the reconvene planning committee, which was held on Thursday, the 7th of July? All right. Don't see anything online there either, members. So, uh, without further ado, uh, members, we will move on to the planning applications listed item or agenda item eight. Uh, and the first item for our deliberation today is LA 11 2021 forward slash O. Um, uh, uh, recommendation for that is a refusal and Maliki uh, is going to take us through that particular report. So um, I'll pass it over to yourself, Maliki. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, item two is an oil line application to provide a detached dwelling with garage, package mm -hmm. treatment plant, and also associated site development works at site adjacent northeast of 28 Woodside Road. And the recommendation is to refuse. Um, the application site is located on the eastern side of Woodside Road, as shown in the um, attached uh, Ordnance Survey map. Um, is the red line is part of a larger hard standing area um, which exists uh, off the roadside um, and is bounded by uh, a security fence uh, as shown in the photographs here. Um, and there's a very wide verge at the front of the site onto Woodside Road. And the proposed site layout um, as shown here is for a single dwelling on the southern part of the site to the north of the existing properties on Woodside Road. The relevant policy context and for the application is set out in the case officer report. Um, and in consideration of this application, we look at the RDS, the area area plan, the SPPS, PPS2, PPS3, PPS15, PPS21, and building on design. We consulted a number of bodies in relation to the application, including NA Water, uh, Environmental Health, DFA Roads uh, and Rivers. Um, the noteworthy consultee in respect of this application is DFA Roads, who requested visibility displays 
a 2.4 by 150 and a forward sight distance of uh, 150. Um, they have noted that the agent has submitted amended plans and maintained the position that the access was in use. Uh, and they're saying if this was in use um, and there was no intensification, they would offer no objections, but that would be a matter for consideration for officers and their recommendation to members. So in terms of policy context, PPS 21 um, sets out the, the types of development which are acceptable uh, in the countryside within CTY 1. It lists a number of applications. Uh, in this case, the applicant is relying uh, on the case that the application is in compliance with CTY 3 of PPS 21. Um, the agent has stated that the concrete yard meets the definition of a building set out in the Planning Act. Northern Ireland 2011, which is defined as any structure or erection or out of any building that's so defined but does not include plant and machinery comprising a building. The agent also states that a new replacement dwelling will bring significant environmental benefits in terms of visual amenity, general amenity, and res residential amenity. Consideration of this uh, supporting case from the agent. Um, officers have taken into account the definition of a building within the Planning Act. Um, as I say, it's set out in Section 250 of the Planning Act. And we've also considered the defin a further definition of a building that's set out in the General Development Planner Planner Order, uh, which excludes a reference to any structure or erection of. In terms of the policy, PPS 121 does not provide a definition of a building. Uh, in, in terms of CTY3, when it refers to replacement dwellings, it says plan permission will be granted for replacement dwelling where the building to be replaced exhibits the essential characteristics of a dwelling and as a minimum, all external structural walls are substantially intact. For the purposes of this policy, all references to dwellings will include buildings previously used as dwellings. The policy text indicates the replacement of dwellings and buildings that have walls and roofs and do not include or refer to the replacement of any structure that might fall into the definition of a building for the purposes of the Planning Act. Um, officers will draw to the amplification um, from policy CTY3, which explains that the replacement of existing dwellings is important to renewal and upgrading of rural stock, housing stock. Uh, the supplementary planning guidance for PPS 21 Build on Tradition has a section on replacement dwellings guiding the siting, size, scale, and form of new replacement dwellings. And there's no reference to replacement of anything other than a dwelling building with walls and roofs. CTY3 does not consider any structure or any part of the building that's referred to the Act as an appropriate building for the purposes of applying policy CTY3. Um, the mere fact that something has been erected on land is not sufficient to make it a building for the purposes of CTY3. And in this case, the proposal does not constitute a replacement dwelling. Therefore, um, in terms of CTY1 and CTY3, the proposal does not meet the requirements of CTY3, nor does it fall within the, any of the other stated range of types of development considered to be acceptable under CTY1. Uh, in the absence of an R evidential context from which to consider the prints of a dwelling on this site, it is considered a proposal does not meet CTY1 uh, of PPS 21, um, which states that um, um, if you're not if you're not one of the stated range of types of development, you um, you must demonstrate that the, the proposal is essential in the rural location and cannot be um, developed within the development limits. CTY3 of PPS21 deals with integration. Although this is an outline application, it is not considered a new building on the site would appear as a prominent feature in the landscape, uh, providing the existing boundaries are attained, a new building would, could satisfactorily be integrated at this location. We've also taken into account CTY8 and CTY14 of PPS21. Um, this immediate section of road is considered to have a substantial and continuously built up frontage comprising a row of more than three buildings. Um, however, the proposal is not a gap site between these dwellings. Instead, it is located to the north of these dwellings. The proposed dwelling would uh, also be intervisible, 
with the dwellings to the southwest when viewed from Woodside Road, thus adding to a build up of development in the area. Um, the development would therefore add to a, a ribbon of development, result in a suburban style build up of development and further erode the rural character of the area, contrary to policy c 2 8 and c 2 14 of PPS 21. Here's a, a photograph of the existing building zoned as 28, 30, and 32 Woodside Road, which lie to the, the south of the application site along the Woodside Road. Um, in terms of PPS3 uh, and response to the, uh, the road service um, consultation, the agent submitted an amended plan in July 22 and has maintained the position that the access was in use and that the existing 2.4 by 90 is available and does not require for a party land. Um, so they haven't advanced um, on the position um, and haven't provided the visibility displays as, as stated. Um, in response, the EFA have reiterated their position. The proposed development will not lead to intensive, if the, if the proposal will not lead to intensification of the existing access, they would offer no objection. Planning officers have not been provided with any further information in respect of the lawful use of the site uh, and therefore maintain the position that the vehicular access as per road service res regional response would be required. Um, the applicant has therefore not demonstrated that the development cannot provide safe access, parking and service and arrangements in accordance with policy AMP2 of PPS3. Uh, We've also considered all our relevant policies in relation to flooding, uh, natural heritage, uh, and residential amenity. Uh, and where there's no significant impacts from the proposed development in respect of those policies. So, in conclusion, uh, and having considered all material planning considerations, including the LDP relevant planning policies, consultations, refusal is recommended as a proposal is contrary to CTY1. CTY3, CTY8, and CTY14 of PPS21, and AMP2 of PPS3. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Maliki. Okay, members. Um, we have uh, one speaker uh, to hear from in relation to this particular item, uh, and uh, that is the agent on behalf of the applicant. So. Um, just to welcome uh, Matt Kennedy online. Matt, uh, you're very welcome. Good to see you. I uh, hope you're keeping well. Um, and um, I'll uh, get the ball rolling and offer you the, the opportunity now to address the committee. So uh, go ahead, Matt. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, councillors, for the opportunity to address the planning committee on this planning application. This proposal was initially in front of the planning committee in June of this year and had strong support from the committee. The applicant has subsequently formally withdrew the second planning application for a dwelling on this site. Planning application LA 11 2021 08260 and the proposed site layout has been updated to reflect the revised proposal for a single dwelling and EFA roads have been reconsulted. I have previously supplied photographs from Google Street View from 2022, 2016, 2012, 2011, mm -hmm. and 29, showing that the existing concreted commercial storage yard and vehicle access has been in place for more than 13 years and is now immune from enforcement. The replacement of this established commercial storage yard by a single dwelling is clearly a planning gain and in the public interest. The replacement of the commercial storage yard by a single dwelling will bring significant environmental benefits through the removal of the visually unsightly concrete yard, the rusty metal fence, the gates and pillars improving the general amenity and appearance of the countryside. The proposal will also approve the general amenity of adjoining residential properties by taking away an adjoining commercial yard and replacing it with a family dwelling. In terms of statutory consultees, I note that DFA roads have stated that if the proposal will not lead the intensification of the existing access, DFA roads offers no objection and provides conditions and informatives 
There is no intensification with this proposal for a single dwelling, which will generate less than 10 traffic movements per day and therefore no objection from road service. In terms of DFA roads, I note that the concrete yard is not affected by any flooding. The only surface water flooding in this area indicated by flood maps NA is actually on the opposite side of Woodside Road, outside of the concrete yard and outside of the application site. It's therefore clear that there are no objections to the planning application from any neighbour and any objections from any statutory consultee, as is as an outline planning application for approval in principle only. Matters of siting, design, materials and finishes can be conditioned to be resolved at reserve matter stage. In terms of the proposed refusal reasons, I don't believe these can be sustained as refusal reason one is an objection in principle to any development in the countryside. However, as this proposal replaces an existing commercial yard in a rural area, it is considered a planning gain and in the public interest. Refusal reason two cannot be sustained as the replacement of this established commercial yard is immune from enforcement, results in clear environmental enhancements and the meaning of gains, and is clearly in the public interest. Refusal reason three can't be sustained as this is a replacement situation, not an unfill application. The concrete yard is already a bit built commitment in the landscape. It is an eyesore and its removal is a planning gain. The proposal also reduces the length of the built up frontage of this location down from 57 metres to 29 metres, therefore further improving visual immunity and reducing the length of the ribbon. Refusal and reason four can't be sustained as this proposal reduces the suburban build up in this area by removing the commercial yard, reducing the built up frontage by half and shrinking the size of the existing ribbon at this location. Refusing reason five, which is the road's reason for refusal, can't be sustained as there is no intensification and DFI road service have not objected to the proposal. Therefore, for the reasons I've set out above, I request that the planning committee support this application. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Okay, members. Uh, pardon me. Uh, so, members, I'm gonna I'm gonna put it over to yourselves for questions for for Matt here. Uh, and I have in the chamber here, uh, Councillor McKinney. Hello, Matt. Thanks for coming along or coming on um, line to speak to us. Um, I'm just reading here. It says description of proposed development uh, is the application is for outline planning permission for outline application to provide detached dwelling with garage, package treatment plant, and all associated site development works. Could you maybe elaborate a wee bit on this package treatment plant? and all associated site development, please. Go ahead, Matt. Matt, sorry to interrupt you. You're in full, you're in full flow there, but unfortunately uh, you're on mute. Sorry, Chair. Apologies. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, technology gets the better of me um, sometimes. Uh, yes, Chair, in terms of what we have submitted here, uh, previously what we had done was we had applied for two dwellings on this site of this concrete yard. And what we had proposed was that we had proposed two dwellings to be developed. Uh, those two dwellings would have been built on the footprint of the existing commercial yard. Um, there would have been two proposed treatment plants um, proposed on the site. What we have done now is that we have reduced the application down to one dwelling, and therefore there's only one package treatment plant proposed on the site. Uh, and in terms of site works, I think we're utilising the existing access. So the amount of site works that is going to be carried out is minimal, other than the removal of the concrete, which is already there. And what we'd be doing is we'd be grassing and greening all that site. So it'll actually be moving from a concrete yard to a residential curtilage and a residential dwelling. So hopefully it'll visually improve and enhance the area. Thank you, Matt. Members, anybody else? Any questions for Mr. Kennedy? Don't see any indicating in the chamber here. Anybody online? Okay, Matt, uh, no further questions in relation to this. <coughs> Members, um, 
and now open it up for questions, queries uh, to Maggie in relation to this. So again, over to yourselves. And again, no questions for Malagi. So, uh, all that leaves me to do then, members, is to uh, point out that the recommendation here is for uh, refusal. Um, Mr. Jackson. Okay, well, good, Chair. Um, I don't know this was discussed, this application was discussed at length uh, in the June committee, which uh, Matt had alluded to. And I think the merits um, and uh, there was a, the merits of the application um, were were discussed uh, um, by various members of the committee. Uh, I was um, a wee bit shocked to see some of the refusal reasons contained within the report, um, particularly um, the, the the refusal reason in relation to the inconvenience of the flow of traffic. Um, given the, cause, cause my reading of the, the consultation with DFA roads, um, was that they were content given that there was no intensification. And it's quite obvious, um, for anybody that knows the area that, that having a dwelling on that site, um, wouldn't lead to intensification of traffic given the, the long historic, um, use of the site. It's a site that I know very well. It's it's not too far from my home. Um, it's it's an area where uh, large la large numbers of the community um, would would go on a walk. Um, it's very popular with walkers, um, and the site's an eyesore. Um, there's no other way around it. Matt um, Matt pointed out the fact that around the established use and. The fact that it's not enforceable um, shows that regardless of the definition of a building, um, the community um, living in this area and anybody passing through, you can't ignore um, the fact that, that the structures that are in place, the, the concrete structures and the fencing are an eyesore. Um, and it's hard to imagine how any, any changes to reduce the impact of, of this structure could be seen as as having a negative impact on the rural character of the area. Um, the, the, the structures, that, the, the biggest impact of the rural character of the area are the existing structure. And um, in my view, I believe that any steps to improve that would, um, and, and using the language that Matt used, would lead to a planning gain and would have a positive impact on the, the character of, of the wider area. So um, I'm not content with the recommendation they, refu they're, they refuse this application. Um, they, this, these types of applications, they come on and regenerate um, the parts of, of our countryside, bring back into use um, pieces of land that, that, that are that are generally an eyesore, um, should be welcomed. And I, as on that view, I'm, I'm content to propose that we overturn the officer's recommendation and then we approve. Um, do you want me to go through the applications or the, the, the refusal reasons? Or, because I know it's Matt, Matt covered them brilliantly, but um, and, and I know it's been discussed um, at length at the last meeting, but if, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll accept the proposal. Um, they, they, they overturn the officer's recommendation. But Chair, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm seeking a bit of guidance. Do you want me to go through the refusal reasons, or are they self-explanatory? Um, do I want you to repeat yourself? In other words. No, I don't need to hear you repeat yourself again, Councillor Jackson. I think it. I think I think we all understand where you're coming from in relation to that. Um, next speaker is Councillor Mooney. Hey, Chair, I'm happy to second Councillor Jackson's proposal on that. Um, 
basically for this, for similar reasons. I'm happy to endorse uh, Mr. Kennedy's um, outline of the five reasons and his uh, views on it. Um, similarly, the, the conjure objection, I love uh, bringing near that side as well, and I'd be a regular user of that road. And uh, this, in my view, like because of conjure objection, would be a gain for the local area because the site as it is now is just ungainly and unsightly. Um, it's a concrete area which serves no useful purpose at the moment, it seems. I would, uh, in my view, um, the application that may be forthcoming would be a gain for, the, for, for that area, and it would uh, smart it up, and it would be um, the existing boundaries will complement a new dwelling as well. So, for the, for the reasons highlighted by Councillor Jackson and by Mr. Kennedy, I would be happy to support the, the application as brought forward proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mooney. Okay, two other indicated speakers in relation to this. Um, Councillor Logue? I, no, just to say I totally agree. I think anything in this site would, would be. Uh, a planning gain, and that, that, to use that terminology again. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Luke. Um, uh, Councillor Gallagher, sorry, I didn't see you there. <laughs> uh, no, just uh, maybe it's just a query in, in, in my back of my mind. And this came in previously, you know, as as a, a double application, uh, and just you when know, you see the plans and you see this current one. It's tucked nicely on the on the one side. Is there, you know, like a possibility? Or, I know this is outlining, but at some stage that we could see the original application coming back in in a different sense. That this is like a, a stepping stone to the one that the committee didn't like in the first place. You know, so I'm just wondering. I know it's outlined. Is, is there conditions and all the rest that we don't end up seeing an application? In the future, that the committee doesn't like. Just right. No, that's a fair enough question. Um, uh, I suppose, Councillor Gallagher, um, and I suppose it's not for me to answer it. So I'm going to ask one of our officers to answer it, if you don't mind. Um, Laura? Sorry, I didn't quite get the question I think. Um, about whether there would be a future potential application similar to this. Is that the question? You want to check? That, that, we might see an application that might look similar to the previous application, that where there was two on the site. Do you know? Yeah, but either way, I suppose the point is that we have to determine whatever applications are in front of us as they are proposed. So this is obviously, in, you know, being presented as an application in its own right, um, and I suppose. And my point on on that as well would be that, you know, we don't have any criteria or anything in CTY, you know, in the current policy that was set aside in terms of plan and gain, that if you have a disused yard or a disused space in the countryside, that that would allow you for a replacement for, for a dwelling. So that's where I would be erring a bit of caution on that um, reason. But that's just a bit of advice. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. Councillor Gallagher, it's kind of half an answer, isn't it? Uh, okay. You're, you're content to move on, aren't you? Uh, okay. Go ahead, Councillor Jackson. Yeah, just for a wee bit of clarity on Councillor Gallagher's point, because um, it's my understanding that there was two applications that came before the June Committee. One was withdrawn, but at no stage did, did this committee make a determination whether we liked it or not. Um, so it's, I think, I think the point that, that the Councillor Gallagher is making is that there was an application that the committee didn't like. Um, isn't exactly accurate. Um, and it's my understanding that the application might have been withdrawn due to the, the issue around intensification. Um, and that's, uh, and that, that issue may well remain regardless of, uh, of uh, Another uh, another application that's coming forward, but that's that that's when we would take the guidance from the FI roads in relation to road safety. Thanks, Chair. All right. Okay. Right. Well, we're not <clears throat> we're not split hairs about the, the language in, in terms of whether 
committee liked it or didn't like it. There was a, there was definitely a conversation around it. And maybe some people didn't like it, and some people did. Um, but we're not going to go back over that. That's all history now. Um, so uh, I think the the explanation come from yourselves, members. Really, was that you know there's a significant community benefit attached um, uh, to this. Um, um, that in actual fact, if anything, it afforded uh, for an improvement um, on rural character because the existing structures, uh, if I can paraphrase you, um, impacted negatively on rural character. Would that be a fair some, um, summary of what you were saying? To the benefit of officers, I think that's fair. Okay. Um, uh, City Solicitor does want to address you also. I'll give him that chance. Yeah, no, thank you, and I'm, I'm just grateful for the uh, point there that um, the chair made in relation to that. My understanding of the position is, and I'm not sure it was clear from what Matt was saying, that what the council is doing here is setting aside policy because of planning gain, rather than saying that this complied with policy uh, because of planning gain, because I don't think it would be factually correct to say that this complied with policy. Okay, members. Um, no other indicated speakers. So uh, there's a recommend. Well, there's um, a proposal from Councillor Jackson, seconded by uh, Councillor Mooney. Uh, I'm going to put the vote to the floor, uh, and so therefore I'm going to ask Maura if you would now uh, record that vote for the benefit of um, everybody online as well. Thank you, Chair. Okay, members, this is item two, and the proposal is not to accept the officer's recommendation um, to refuse the application. Alderman Alan Breslin. Four. Thanks, Alan. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Abstain, Mara. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Drew Thompson. Uh, four. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Barr has apologised. Uh, Ray Councillor Raymond Barr. Four. Thank you. Councillor John Boyle. Four. Councillor Angela Dobbins. Four, Maura. Thank you. Councillor Paul Gallagher. Four. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Four. Thank you. Councillor Dan Kelly. Councillor Kelly. Oh, he's obviously not arrived yet. Councillor Patricia Logue. Thanks, Patricia. Councillor Kieran Maguire. Four more. Thank you. Councillor Philip McKinney. Four. Thanks. And Councillor Sean Mooney. Four. Thank you. That's 11 four and one abstention. And one abstention. Okay, um, <clears throat> that's 11 for one abstention. Uh, so clearly, um, the proposal from uh, Councillor Jackson and, and, and Councillor Mooney has uh, now carried. Members, can I um, advise as well, ju just for the benefit of the public record, um, uh, as more so those in the chamber, despite the fact that you're in the chamber and the head of planning can hear you say for or against, you have to record that and uh, by using the microphone because it's obviously these meetings are recorded for the public record, so if that's at all possible. Um, it's not a criticism, but I know sometimes we can we can just think naturally enough, I can hear it and we can all hear each other. Um, and I don't see that as a, an issue for the last one, if you know what I mean, but there can be times in the future where people will be saying, oh, I wasn't able to hear what he said because I, it wasn't recorded. All right. So, um, and I've been as guilty of myself, I'm sure, in the past, so just a uh just an observation i suppose okay members so uh thank you for that and we're going to move on now to item number three on the agenda um item number three is j20 2007 uh, 0416 forward slash f um and that again is down as a refusal in our packs and suzanne is going to prevent well, I'm sure you'll all agree it was a very lengthy report, so. 
already, you see. I just forgot to do something that I told you I was going to do. <laughs> uh, members, before Suzanne presents that, uh, there are quite a significant number of late items for you now uh, to consider, uh, many of which came out this morning. Um, and I think you deserve adequate time to consider them. Uh, uh, I'll initially start with perhaps allowing for 20 minutes to, to go through them. Uh, and see how that goes, because as I said, there are quite a number of items. If members are, are then indicating to me that they're all content to move on sooner than that, then we'll move on sooner than that. Okay, so we'll take that, we'll take that 20 minutes or so. Okay.
Um, members who are online, this is, uh, this is a question more for all of your benefit. Um, are you all content to move on now, or do you, any of you feel that you require any further time to consider the information in front of you? If I, Councillor Logue, you still want to... I'm still reading. I, I don't know what we're at, Ms. Logue. I have read it before, but I, I want to... No, no, absolutely. Councillor Logue, if you feel... Another five minutes, please. I, absolutely. I'm, I, there's no way I'm racing this forward unless I feel that everybody um, is content to move forward. So, uh, members, uh, we'll take another five minutes at least. Okay.
Thank you, members. Uh, and again, if everybody's online um, is content to proceed, if I don't hear otherwise, then we'll be uh, moving on from from that. Um, thanks everybody for taking that wee bit of time. I think it was important to do. Um, I know, obviously, most of us will have they had the opportunity to read through it this morning, you know. But I think that little bit extra uh, allows us to maybe have a quick look at it again. Um, so. Members, uh, I'm just looking to see uh, everybody who's in the chambers here. Okay, so uh, Suzanne, um, if you'd like to present uh, the report for item number three. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, okay, members, so this is item number three, j two thousand seven zero four one six f and the application is for the phased extension to an existing sand and gravel pit, including the regularisation of an area of excavated bedrock within the southeastern section of the existing permitted quarry, phased restoration, relocation of existing washing plant and associated settlement lagoons and final restoration of the entire extraction area to agricultural grasslands and the location is 360 metres northeast of 35 Castle Warren Road, Donamana. Members, just uh, before I go into the details of the site location map, just with regard to late information, I just want to update, just to advise you that obviously we have correspondence from uh, Tom Buchanan and Mr Brown, the objector, uh, which I will consider at the end of the presentation. The other correspondence submitted by Carson Madole, just to advise you, the letter of the 8th of June 2021 um, has already been submitted, obviously, last year and is considered it in your report today. The letter to me on the 1st of August is also considered in your report today and the report dated the 9th of June 2021 was submitted to council officers on the 26th of August last year. That has been reconsulted to the various statutory consultees and is also considered in your report today. So just for clarity on those uh, late items. So moving on to the site location map in front of you, that shows you the, the site outlined in red. Um, within the site, obviously, I don't know if you can see my, my mouse there, but this is the Hall Road here. This road here is Castle Warren Road, which uh, the site uh, straddles at various locations. The Hall Road also goes across that um, and out onto the main road. Uh, this area in blue here is the Alton Reburn, and we can see within the site, obviously you'll know there's an existing permission within part of the site, uh, which has now expired. Uh, so in terms of the satellite um, imagery, we've just shown you there a Google Earth image taken from May 2022, um, and then the ortho map satellite taken in May 2019. So the application is obviously for the phased extension to an existing sand and gravel pit. It's seeking to regularise existing development within the site. And the agent's environmental statement addendum in 2020 also notes that the ongoing extraction forms part of the project, which is the, the subject of the environmental statement, which was submitted back in 2007. Um, and the environmental information submitted thereafter and thus has been assessed as required in accordance with the EIA regulations 1999. So the site area is approximately 40 hectares. There's around 30 hectares just under that of existing and proposed operations. It's proposed to develop the site out over six phases in a sequential approach. Um, it's proposed to extract 105,000 tonnes of material annually. As I said earlier, there is an existing permission on the site, which was for approximately five hectares within the centre of the site, which uh, expired on the 13th of September 2013. So looking at the site in the surrounding area, it's two kilometres northeast of Dunhamana. It's adjacent to 35 Castle Warren Road. Um, the Castle Warren Road bounds the site to the west and north. Uh, it's within Church Hill, a low rounded hill. Uh, land to the north, you'll be aware, rises to the summit of Sleeve Kirk. Uh, the Sparrow AONB runs through the site. That's uh, shown in drawn figure 15 in your report. Uh, the landscape within the area is varied. It's improved grasslands, scattered dwellings, farm holdings, and the site is lies outside the Glen Ellie Valley of Area Mineral Constraint in the Strabane Area Plan. In terms of, of 
planning site constraints. It's partly within the spare and AONB. Uh, there is there are two archaeological monuments, one within the site, the Holy Well, and the ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical site, um, which lies just to the south. In terms of the site history, um, there is obviously permission for sand and gravel, which has expired. Um, in 2014, there was an application submitted to vary a number of conditions on that original permission. Um, the applicant lodged uh, one of which, sorry, which was the to, to remove the period, the time period for extraction. Um, the applicant lodged a non-determination appeal to the Planning Appeals Commission. That was just heard after we transferred on October 15. Um, and under the Transitional Provisions Council um, carried out that appeal or defended that appeal. The Planning Appeals Commission um, permission was not granted um, in that case. In 2016, there was a lawful development certificate granted for um, processing of minerals, washing and stockpiling of sand and gravel with the washing plant um, with associated equipment, including settlement lagoons. Those were granted um, as they were immune. And in terms of the 2019 lawful development certificate, this was decided by the PAC um, and the existing development. The part of this one really is the Hall Road. Um, part of the Hall Road was, was considered lawful and that's also in your packs. So just in terms of the site, I thought it was useful just put up some photographs um, initially. This is the, I mean, uh, there was a site visit carried out on this back in July last year and some of you will who attended that will recall the site. So this is the views of the Hall Road and this is looking at the site from the southeast. Uh, direction. This is the actual access in the Castle Warren Road. Uh, so as you can see, it's quite a narrow road. Um, this is the site looking from the north, um, the northern part of the Castle Warren Road. Um, this area to the green here is actually what would be phase two uh, once it's developed. So as you can see, extraction is ongoing at the site, uh, has, uh, has continually been ongoing at the site. Uh, again, look. This is looking from the Castle Warren Road to the north northwest. We're looking in there at. You're looking over here at phase four. Uh, phase five is undeveloped out here to your right. And this is looking sort of in the, to the more westerly uh, from that north from that same part of Castle Warren Road. This will be looking out to, to phase to the area where phase two is going to be developed. And sort of beyond this, this bond, this berm here, you would, you would drop into the quarry, into the quarry floor. Again, another view, just um, more obviously from, taken from the road, there's the hedge. Again, this area out here to the right is where phase five is proposed, and that takes you up to the, the, the other part of the Castle Warren Road. Um, and that's just another um, photo from the other more northeasterly minor road. In terms of, so of photos within the site then, so these photos were taken in April 2021. Um, myself and one of the other officers visited the site just to give you an idea of, of inside. Obviously, we have, you know, um, some of the mobile plant uh, that's been working on site. You can see the, the, the piles, the, the stockpiles. You can see the lagoons, the, the drainage, the sort of... Um, provisions that, that form within the site. Uh, this here was obviously was a rock hammer, which we witnessed on site to extract in, I think it was phase 1A uh, within the plans. Um, again, here's one mobile plant, screener and a crusher on site. And you can see there just in terms of the dumper trucks and the scale of the of the operation there and, and the piles of, of the material. Um, so those are just really to give you an idea of the inside of the site. Uh, the other photos there you can see was taken in the 5th of November 2020. Again, the stockpiles within the site. Um, the structure here on the left is the washing plant that is actually taken sort of with, from within the site just beside phase where phase two will be proposed. Um, and again, there's no mobile plant there. And the other photo to the right. 
So in terms of the consultees on the application, um, they are listed, they're sort of in detail in your report. Um, I don't plan to go into those um, responses in detail now, um, but the consultees are listed. Uh, in terms of representations, there have been 63 objections from eight individual properties. There have been two petitions of objection, one with 14 signatures and one with 10 signatures, and there have been six letters of support, and those were provided as late information back in June last year. In terms of the issues, um, the summary of the objections, um, issues, with, you know, issues with regard to noise from the, the process and plant traffic machinery, the noise level has not been realistic, uh, just in terms of changes from the projected noise levels, uh, the monitoring not being carried out reasonably, the methodology in the noise impact assessment considered not accurate, um, the noise levels exceeding the background levels of 32 decibels by more than 10 decibels. The, EH, the environmental health conditions um, not enforceable, uh, no mitigation in terms of dust, Operating hours not being adhered to, obviously serious road safety concerns in terms of visibility displays, inadequate intensification, the haul routes not being followed, um, the traffic assessment details being contradictory, um, the visual impact in the AONB, operating without planning permission and the water table being at risk um, through groundwater abstraction and the settlement ponds being filled with the groundwater source. Um, also considered that the description is inaccurate, misleading and ambiguous, um, that the processing should be moved off site to another um, site in Lupin Avenue, um, operated by the company. Um, the process has not been lawful. Um, the EIA baseline information not correct and has not been corrected. Um, the consideration of alternatives in the EIA um, not been fully considered. Uh, there's obviously another site at Kildog Road, which has been operated by the um, operator. And the site for relocation of the plant may not be suitable. And then ultimately then that the residential amenity and the first protocol of the Human Rights Act should be respected, which is the right of peaceful enjoyment of your property. So looking at the representations of support, uh, we have six letters from construction companies, all dependent on the sand and gravel from this site. Two of them are based in Donegal. Um, they're creating, you know, they're, they're raising issues that obviously in terms of major supply chain issues and concerns that the, the local economy will be detrimentally impacted on if the application um, doesn't go ahead. So in terms of the policy framework members, it's listed in your reports. It's the RDS, the SPPS, the Strabane Area Plan, the Planning Strategy from Rural Northern Ireland, which contains the minerals policies in addition to the Strabane Area Plan, with PPS 2, 3, 6 and 15. So looking then at the actual planning assessment and the consideration, the material considerations and the recent conclusion of the environmental statement and environmental information, um, so the proposal constitutes AIA development. Uh, there was an involuntary environmental statement submitted back in on the 2nd of July 2007. This has been amended a number of times, uh, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2017 and 2020. Um, the proposal constitutes unauthorised EIA development um, because obviously it's EIA development which is ongoing without any permission. At the moment, there's no permission exists on the site at all, other than what is lawful. You can see just on the screen on the right, I've included two, the two um, parts of the site which are lawful. So we have the yellow shaded area in terms of the extraction, uh, which was considered lawful. And there are a number of settlement lagoons which are considered lawful within the site. And then the orange shaded area of the Hall Road is also considered lawful. So looking at the contents of environmental statements, just, you know, you can see there originally in 2007, there were nine chapters. This has been updated, um, you know, consecutively over the years. And you can see the details and the different and the more detailed information which has been received uh, in the updated environmental statement addendum in 2020. 
So, um, looking at the EIA assessment, obviously this is quite, um, you know, the guidance would require that that, it, that environmental statements are reg regular, rigorously scoped and assessed. This application and constitutional authorised EIA, um, and there are legal principles to be met prior to grant and plan permission. Those have been highlighted very recently, just before Christmas, by the department, and it's Practice Note 9A, uh, published um, in 2021. And it advises that there are four tests, which we know. Uh, A, there have to be demonstrable exceptional circumstances that justify the grant of retrospective consent. There has to, it has to be clear the developer has neither gained nor stands to gain any unfair advantage from their breach of planning control. The public and other stakeholders must have equal opportunity to express their views on the environmental information and the information has to be regularly scoped to ensure its assessment is based on a reasonable estimation of the baseline environment as likely to be existed on site prior to the unauthorised EIA development having taken place. And the onus members is on the developer to provide except, prove exceptional circumstances, no unfair advantage, evidence of the environmental baseline prior to any of the development having taken place. So I'm going to take you through firstly the, each of the phases of development very briefly because obviously there's a lot of detail included in your report. Phase 1A, uh, which you can see here, members in the sort of peachy highlighted area with the, the little arrows, um, this area has extraction has been ongoing, ongoing on this area uh, and the environmental information proposes to extract approximately 155,000 cubic metres of material through two and a half to three years. There are no proposed levels in the plans submitted for this site. Um, in, 18, in April 2021, Council staff did take levels which estimated that the Phase 1A had already been uh, excavated down to 75 metres OD ordnance datum. Uh, there, are, there is evidence of rock uh, within this part of the site and that was where we obviously had, had, had came across the rock hammer. Phase 1B then uh, incorporates part of Phase 1A and then moves to the southwest. Um, it's proposed. It's also currently been extracted, and the agent has or the the solicitor has advised us of that again on the first of August. That that's the part of the site that's um, currently been extracted. Uh, it's proposed uh, approximately 260,000 cubic metres over four years. Uh, it's also proposed in this phase to construct three new silt lagoons into the floor of phase 1A and 1B during phase 1B. And it's also proposed to accommodate the, the washing plant, which is lawful, um, the relocation of it prior to the commencement of phase two. That relocation requires a stability stability analysis. To date, we have no information on, on whether that can or cannot be facilitated. In terms of phase two, then, um, it's extending further sort of northeast, uh, and that's proposed. So that's currently not developed. Uh, it's current, and it's currently proposed 170 cubic, 170,000 cubic meters of minerals over three years. And the development of phase two will allow the restoration of phase one B back to agricultural lands. In terms of phase three, it's extending in a northerly direction then, okay, just further north of phase two. You can see I'm just highlighting it there. And the topsoil and the overburden will be used to create a bond along the eastern boundary. Uh, and it's proposed here that there, if there will be the release of 135,792 cubic metres over two to two and a half years. The restoration of phase two, uh, which, which is just below, will take place during the extraction of phase three. And the phase three restoration is to correspond with the phase four extraction, which is already underway. Um, so just looking then at phase four, um, I think it's just appropriate here at this point just to flag up the centre of the site here where the existing permission was within the centre of the site. So phase four extends westerly. Extraction has commenced. So obviously the phasing uh, plan is out of sequence. The restoration plan is out of sequence. Um, there's been no updates provided on the volumes remaining and the timescales that are left. 
There is a proposal to create a bond um, to provide noise mitigation phase four because some of the residential amenity, the properties that are, are most severely impacted lie just so it's slightly to the north of, of phase four. Um, so again, just devise there it's out of sequence. Phase five then uh, is the final phase. It's currently undeveloped and you can see phase four just moving in the arrows end of phase five. The topsoil is to be stripped to create a bond along the northern boundary and it's proposed to develop over five and a half years, five to five and a half years and release three 377,000 cubic metres of material. Um, and there will be full restoration proposals after the quarry is exhausted. You'll notice here as well, members, just in terms of the red lines, the red line boundary. So Castle Warren Road runs down here. Uh, this was this original part of the site um, adjacent to Duck Lock was actually removed, um, as well as an area up here to the north east of the site. So there's no extraction proposed within those areas, but the applicant has kept them within the red line. Phase five is obviously adjacent to the road. So in terms of the final restoration proposals, uh, the proposed phasing plan, you know, officers consider it cannot be implemented because phase 1A, 1B and 4 already commenced. Um, the environmental statement addendum in 2020 um, includes new includes two new bonds into the boundaries of phases four and five. Uh, the time scale is dependent on the overall time period for extraction. We've had no sort of updated um, advice on what is the overall time period for extraction, given the ongoing extraction to date. Um, it was originally estimated back in 2007 that it would be 15 years. Um, so uh, the, just the other issue in terms of the Hall Road is not, the Hall Road has been excluded from the final restoration proposals. Um, I would query that given the final restoration that the Hall Road, we would create the necessity of the Hall Road at that stage. So just in terms of the final restoration, the plan um, considers, you know, proposing to return the mix of traditional grazing and hedgerows back to agricultural land. Um, and the, that's just the detailed plan. It's quite hard to make out there, but I can take any queries on the plan that you have. So in terms of the planning assessment, I am just going to go through um, the fundamental points in relation to each section. So in, in terms of the consideration of alternatives, um, the environmental impact regulations require us to consider alternatives locations. So were there, are there any other areas, any other more suitable sites for this development? Um, and in 2007 and 2012, there were 10 alternative locations presented. Um, but the reasons, you know, why they couldn't be, why they weren't appropriate were, you know, the, the site was exhausted, near exhaustion and, and not available for acquisition. Um, there was a Kildog Road site included in, in 2019, but the agent considered the absence of planning approval documents meant it couldn't be considered. Since then, Council is now aware that um, extraction has started again on that site by the operator. Um, and, you know, it, it's officers view that this information should be included within the consideration of alternatives. So therefore, that that element of the assessment is inadequate. Um, that project, that ongoing extraction would be considered part of the same project for the purposes of EIA and should be addressed. Looking at socioeconomic issues, no relevant information submitted on this in the environmental statement and the environmental statement addendum info to date. Um, on the 26th of August 2021, so in that big report and you laid information today, members, you will see that there is uh, economic arguments being put forward um, in terms of the benefits to be considered, you know, staff, 30 members of staff, the £750,000 wages per annum, um, the employment of, of local subcontractors, supporting the economy in an economically deprived area, um, the fact that the company um, has supplied council with sand for several projects, including council sports pitches, uh, the company supplies sand and gravel to other construction companies and manufacturers, and obviously we have six letters of support that to um, respond with that. 
The op operator clearly does make a significant contribution to the local and regional economy, and given the size of the site, it's 40 hectares, um, it represents a potential regionally significant um, application in terms of social, economic and environmental factors. But officers consider this doesn't outweigh the detrimental impacts on residential amenity and the environment, which are considered further in the case. In terms of geology, um, just looking at the site, um, the geological context is uh, metamorphic rock. Uh, there were borehole studies carried out back in the 2007 environmental statement, um, which shows uh, rock lying low lying in the northeastern portion of the site, um, but nowhere else in the extractions at that time. Uh, the application does seek to regularise an area of bedrock in the southeast section, but rock has also been extracted from phases 1A and 1B, and this is not included in any of the environmental information to date. This would require clarification. In terms of the mining waste plan, officers have reviewed that again. Consider, look, there, there are no issues in terms of that. The material is inert. It's been it's been reused on site in terms of the restoration. Um, and so the mining waste plan issues um, are, are considered satisfactory. Looking at hydrogeology, water quality and drainage, and the water management infrastructure. Um, just in terms of the hydrogeology, this really relates to the excavation levels and the proximity to the water table. Um, the Alton Re burn lies to the east of the site at 75 metres OD. Um, and in 2007, it was proposed to go down to 78 to 86 metres OD. Um, the area to the west where phase five is was removed um, in terms of its proximity to duck lock um, to remove any concerns that water management had about the impacts on groundwater flow. So the current drawings on the 2020 environmental information only proposes excavation to 80 metres OD, but, you know, Council has taken levels on site in April 21 and parts of the site have been excavated down to 75 metres OD. That's in phases 1A and 1B, which are the two of the closer phases to the Altonary burn. So officers would consider, look, there's been no updated hydrogeology hydro survey um, and we would require the full details regarding groundwater um, to be considered um, as part of the ongoing extraction that's taken place. The water quality and drainage, it's proposed, the original environmental statement proposed it through runoff, through controlled settlement lagoons and appropriate discharge uh, requirements. Um, and it also proposes no effluent being allowed to escape untreated from the site. Um, the two main water bodies of the site are Ducklock and Altonary Burn. Altonary Burn is a tributary um, of the River Foyle. So the SAC, so there are concerns there about anything entering the burn that could um, ultimately end up impacting on the SAC. Um, in theory, the current proposal does not prov does provide appropriate standoff to the burn. And that those those measures include separation but buffers and a one meter freeboard above the water table. But as works have been ongoing and not included in the environmental information, um, it's quite clear that in those areas, for example, phase one A and one B, a one, a one meter freeboard cannot be achieved because they have already been excavated down to the water table. So those issues we feel have not been sufficiently addressed um, within the environmental information and council must consider the precautionary approach in relation to this. Looking at the water management infrastructure, uh, the agent advises in the environmental statement addendum in 2019, this would fall under permitted development, but there is no permitted development for EIA development. Um, officers consider um, so this is an evolving situation, but there's no information to outline the sequencing, the timeframes, um, any, any proposals following the proposed relocation of the, of the lawful washing plant. So just moving on then to noise. So noise is obviously a fundamental consideration, members, of any uh, minerals proposal. Um, there have been objections received on this since the submission back in 2007. Clearly it is, it is a quiet rural area and those of you who are on the site visit will appreciate that. The background noise levels are 32 dBA. 
The environmental information to date includes a number of noise assessments, and um, at most re the most recent one updated the, the noise sensitive receptors. You can see them, I've marked them on the map there to the, the right of your slide. So each of these um, yellow areas is a noise sensitive receptor, and those will be considered in your report. There has been noise modelling provided based on the sources of noise identified in the environmental statement and those are in terms of the machinery within the site. Uh, those are included in paragraph 11.48 11 of your report but um, notably that modelling does not include the mobile plant a lot, a lot of them are the mobile plant that has been used and the rock hammer which we're aware has been used on the site. The impact on the noise sensitive receptors, um, just very briefly, you know, noise sensitive receptors one and five, they're both financially linked to the development. NSR5 will be impacted by exceeded noise levels during phase five. So um, that's just over here. Um, noise NSR2 and 3, um, the predicted noise levels at both properties will, will range from 40.5 to to 44.8 for NSR2 um, and 40.6 and 44.6 for NSR3. Um, environmental health don't agree with the worst case scenario predicted levels at each noise sensitive receptor being of little difference. Um, and although the levels are all below 45 dBA. NSR4 is currently 280 metres uh, for the nearest point of external amenity space. Um, and this noise sensitive receptor will benefit from the relocation of the washing plant before phase two is commenced. So it's proposed to locate the washing plant, you can just see it outlined here, uh, up whenever um, prior to phase two commencing, proposed to locate it up here, but that requires a stability survey, which, which hasn't been carried out. Um, just in terms of then, there's additional bonding proposed as well as part of the environmental information to try and reduce the noise levels impacting on, on NSR4. Um, however, environmental health advice, there's a depression in the bond will not enable a continuous barrier. So there's issues again. And now NSR6 on the bottom will just mainly be impacted on by HGV movements. Um, there's significant mitigation proposed in the environmental statement 2020, you know, for example, working hours, and they're all listed within paragraph 1150 of your report. Um, and obviously the existing permission on site has expired since the 20th of September 2013. So apart from those areas considered immune from enforcement, all other extra extraction taken on place in phases 1A, 1B and 4 do not have planning permission. Um, therefore, if additional plant has been used or might be used in the future, it must be part of the environmental information for this application. We are aware, obviously, that there was mobile plant used on the site so intensively back in January 2020 that Environmental Health formally advised the operator to cease um, or they would pursue um, an abatement notice and, and that was responded to and, and on that occasion. Um, the agents point in the letter of the 1st of August 2022 that as, in, as Council's Environmental Health did not establish a statutory noise nuisance at the site, the applicant's current op operations are not creating a nuisance. Um, that would not be in line with the assessment that we're required to carry out as, as required in, in the SPPS. Um, in terms of paragraph 4.4a or 4.11 and obviously you know just because there's no statutory noise nuisance found um and the fact that the agent considers that we could we should attach a condition um as we've done on other planning applications um we feel that this is not a reasonable argument as the residential amenity can be impacted by excessive noise as a result of noise levels below those required to establish a statutory noise nuisance um and the operator has felt it necessary to use machinery and equipment um which is not included within the environmental information um so it, it would not be appropriate for us to attach conditions that we know cannot fully be met in terms of noise, I think it is important to consider the Planning Appeals Commission previous decision back in October 20, 
October 2015, um, whereby they concluded that to extend the operational period for extraction would unacceptably harm the immunity of the residents at Castle Warren Road. And um, so th that is, I, I think, um, a, a quite an important consideration in the issues in relation to noise. So, um, you know, the report considers this is this case is different to other approvals in the district, um, given the the surrounding neighbours, the proximity that the you know, and also the the scale of the operation. Moving on then to ecology. Um, so the initial environmental information indicated there, was, there were four main potential impacts, loss of habitats, mature trees and possible disturbances to badger set. Um, you can see in the map in front of you there, the blue star is just where the badger set was located, um, just on the, on the top corner there. So this area then um, further was pulled out of the extraction, was removed from there by the agent to um, take to take on board the advice of NIEA. Um, there was a phase one habitat survey carried out back in February 2007 um, and there was mitigation recommended. Uh, dock lock was also removed in 2019. Um, another further ecological survey was carried out um, and again further mitigation proposed. In September 2020 a further updated ecological assessment was carried out and detected minimal changes. Um, and there was a waiting bird survey carried out in May 2020 um, because there were concerns with lapwings on the site, but um, it was considered that they were passage birds and NAEA accepted that. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of you know mitigation conditions by NIEA for the creation of fencing and separation distances between the development and the nearby watercourses to prevent pollution, um, LOCKS agency recommends best environmental practice. Um, but the environmental information does not address how those watercourses have been protected to date, given the unauthorised development that has continued on the site. This would be required as, as part of the baseline information. Um, and similarly, as regards the conclusion of the stage two habitats assessment, uh, whilst clearly mitigation can be provided for future development, the impacts of the unauthorised development have not been considered. Therefore, in the absence of this fundamental information, um, we cannot determine with certainty and we must take the precautionary approach uh, on this. So another fundamental issue within the consideration of this application is the archaeology issues. And the application site does include a holy well, St Colum Kills Well, and that is located here. If you can just see my mice circling with so it's within the site. Um, the application site is also close to an ecclesiastical site uh, beyond the southwestern boundary, which is down here. Um, and the third site uh, is located outside the, the site boundary, um, which was an area of standing stones, but there's no visible elements exist. So the environmental information included in the updated archaeological assessment um, illustrates that only two areas of the site have been subject to archaeological monitoring to date. That's the hatched area within the diagram in front of you here. Um, and then two areas around the Holy Well were monitored and evaluated and no archaeological remains were recovered. But nothing else has happened within the site. Council is aware that a licence has been granted um, in May last year for excavation. It's been granted outside the planning process um, and licensing department confirmed last week that uh, they were notified and, and I think it was the 10th of June that work was to commence, but there have been no reports, findings, monitorings, outcomes provided to date. Um, the environmental information proposes that no mitigation could be put in place for the areas already subjected to invasive works, um, as all archaeological remains within those areas have been subject to the highest level of impact and no longer exist. Um, and this is really fundamental, members, in terms of the unauthorised EIA. Uh, this, this would be required as part of the baseline information to establish a reasonable baseline. Objectors have also concerns in terms of the ongoing works in relation to that as well. 
Um, in terms of the consultation responses, I know there's a lot of correspondence included today from the agent that the Historic Environment Division have no objections. Um, on the receipt of the report of, that's submitted today, I, I did consult HED and I asked them to specifically consider the element of an authorised EIA. Um, they firstly came back and said, look, we want some monitoring done to be done now before the application would proceed. Um, this was challenged by the agent, and then they come back again to say, "Look, they're going to they were referring the matter of an authorised EIA back to council, and then if it was resolved, they had attached their standard conditions." Um, so it's really a matter for council for for officers uh, to consider their responses and material consideration members. Um, in this case, HED have clearly referred it back to Council for consideration, so um, we wouldn't agree with the stance that HED are not raising any concerns, therefore there's no issue. Um, we have a duty to apply the precautionary approach. This is outlined in the SPPS and in PPS 6, also in relation to archaeological monuments and remains. And the RDS, the Regional Development Strategy, also specifically refers to the protection of the historic environment as being a regional priority. Um, so that is really the summary in terms of the archaeology issues to date. Looking at the landscape and the visual issues, obviously the AONB uh, straddles the site. It's not very clear in your packs, but this line here, everything to the southeast of that is AONB. This was designated back in 2008. Um, the original environmental statement did carry out a landscape and visual assessment prior to the documents. Um, during the processing of the application um, by the DOE, um, the relocation of the washing plant was an intrinsic element to improve the visual impact of the AONB site. Um, However, in terms of the phasing, um, I feel this is a really fundamental issue in terms of the landscape and the visual and the restoration. The fact that the phasing has not been complied with, the phasing as proposed has not been followed, um, that is going to have a huge uh, impact on how this site is restored in the future and ultimately how it's protected. And the Straban Area Plan actually gives greater protection to the AONB sites for minerals development in AONB areas and sites outside it um, and clearly by the scale of the site members um, there is a large area of land that will require to be restored. The phasing proposals and the landscape and the visualist proposals to date um, do not adequately or sufficiently address those uh, expansive visual disturbance concerns and the intrusions the mineral operation will will is and will create further in the AONB. Moving on then to dust and air quality. Um, so the, there were some uh, elements of the environmental information in terms of dust and mitigation. Um, and, you know, the quarry has been operating to date without following its dust management plans. We've had objections in terms of the dust and this retrospective development has not been captured adequately within the environmental information or address, addressed satisfactorily. Dust, mitigation, those issues are real fundamental elements of, of, of looking at minerals operations in the countryside. Both MIN6 and the Straban Area Plan height, highlight the importance of those effective measures. Moving on to flood risk and drainage. Um, flood risk was first assessed in 2012. You can see there in that first location map, the, the blue shaded areas are, are areas uh, of, of floodplain. Um, and the risk, the fluvial, the risk of fluvial flooding primarily confined to land to the north and the northwest of the Alt Marine Burn. Um, the agent did amend this in uh, 2012 and clarified that no extraction will be taken within those areas. So in the slide on the right side of your screens, I've just taken that out of the agent's environmental statement. I think it's it helpfully demonstrates the, the red line denotes the site boundary. The yellow line denotes the proposed excavation limit all outside the floodplain. This also means inf no infilling of the floodplain should occur and in theory no material increase in flood risk. Um, 
there are some issues just in terms of the application of a free board, one metre free board. That obviously conflicts with the current levels recently taken by council staff, whereby parts of the site are back down to the water table, where, whereby no free board could be incorporated. Um, so in considering the surface water flood risk, um, the FLD requires details to be demonstrated that adequate measures we put in place to mitigate. Um, the Environmental Statement 2019 advises that the provision of a detailed drainage can be implemented through permitted development. But again, members, there's no permitted development for um, EIA applications. Um, moving on then, just finally in terms of the, the roads, obviously access is onto Castle Warren Road, part of the Hall Routes Lawful, which I've indicated. Um, there are um, inconsistencies in terms of the information being submitted. It was initially proposed to extract 25 tonnes a year using 20 HGVs per day. It's now proposed to extract 105,000 tonnes per year still using 20 HGVs per day. Um, there's obviously issues in terms of the whole route not being followed and obviously the objections clearly um, consider that. So there has been some betterment, some planning or some improvements uh, to the access have been made in terms of visibility displays. But the, the bigger issue here is intensification, which the road service has deferred back to council for consideration. So we've also considered that the fundamental issue of expansion of the operations has not been fully considered um, and these, this must be considered um, fully and appropriately um, and consequently we've had to recommend refusal on that as well. So as part of the environmental information we're required to provide a recent conclusion of the environmental information. So clearly the existing and proposed environmental impacts have not been adequately captured in the environmental information and the unauthorised EIA, there are legal requirements that have to be met. Um, so those four legal principles have to be met. Um, and it's our view that, you know, the, the phasing and restoration, the impacts on geology, hydrogeology, archaeology, et cetera, have not been captured or assessed satisfactory to date. Therefore, Council is prohibited from granting permission under Regulation 4 of the 1999 EIA um, information or regulations. Moving on then, members, to the lead items. So we have the first lead item from Mr Thomas Buchanan, MLA. That's an email highlighting concerns about the way forward and obviously the, the economic impact, the loss of jobs. We have the objector, Mr Brown, um, highlighting residential media issues enforcement and previous site history. And then we have Mr McBurney, the solicitor on behalf of the agent, who is citing the procedural flaws, consideration of late information, lack of engagement. Um, and I just want to put it on record that council officers have exercised their statutory functions in reaching the recommendation. The delegated refusal protocol does not apply to this application. It's a committee application. Um, council does not accept that the agent team were not aware of all the issues um, and all the previous information that's been submitted has been considered. Um, and the fact remains the agent team doesn't accept council's recommendation. So clearly the, the recommendation is to refuse members and we have 10 reasons for refusal which are listed in detail in your report. I can take questions on the reasons for refusal. I don't propose to go into them all in detail at this stage. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, I think the word comprehensive would probably be an understatement today. Um, uh, quite a quite a significant uh, presentation, members. But I, I think we all appreciate. Uh, and understand the reasons why, because this has been uh, convoluted and, and complicated, uh, to say the least, by a number of different issues, which clearly uh, we all have to consideration. Uh, 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 we've reached the consideration stage of it. Um, members, I'm going to take some direction from yourselves at this point in the meeting. Um, however, just to inform you before we do that, uh, there are a number of speakers um, available here this afternoon who, who want to address the committee. Um, there are two speakers 
potentially on behalf of the applicant, uh, one speaker on behalf of an objector. Uh, uh, we also, of course, have our own officer team here, including uh, Paul McSwiggan from the um, EHD team at the uh, Dyson and Stavon District Council, uh, and Kieran Rogers as well from the uh, Council Planning Committee's enforcement team. So, um, and the reason I point all of that out to you is um, that we have almost reached a two hour stage in this meeting. I suspect if we move to hear all of these speakers uh, at this point, then it could be another hour at least before I can give everybody a break. So I'm suggesting before we do that, if it's all right with all of you, that we take that break now uh, and come back and then hear from the other speakers. So is everybody content with that reaction of travel? Okay, yeah, thank you. So let's take 10 minutes, folks, um, and then we'll come back to this. All right, thank you. And again, thank you, Suzanne.
Okay, um, welcome back everybody, and um, thanks for your patience in, in relation to that matter, but I don't think it'd be reasonable perhaps to expect people to sit for two, three years without being able to take a comfort break, so um, now you've all had that chance. Uh, right, as I advise, there are a number of speakers, um, we'll take them in the normal order. We also do have, as I said, uh, Paul McSwiggan from the Envir Environmental Health Department of Council and Kieran Rogers from the enforcement team here as well. They're here for uh, for members who may want to ask them questions uh, further on down the line, uh, and not necessarily for now. Um, and so the first speakers we have uh, on behalf of the applicant, uh, we have Mr. Grant McBurney and uh, Mr. Gareth McCallion. And again, Bearing in mind um, the the amount of information uh, that was given to the committee in presentation, the level of documentation, etc., that members have um, had the opportunity to uh, consider, and for the advice of uh, Mr. McBurney and Mr. McCallion, and indeed uh, Ms. Gillen, uh, our normal um, protocol would be that we would afford um, uh, speakers for objectors five minutes and speakers for. Uh, the applicant five minutes. I think uh, in light of what I've just said, uh, in terms of the length of the report given, the amount of information contained, that I, uh, I'm i going to allow uh, 10 minutes to those uh, speakers. So, uh, Mr McBurney, Mr McCallion, between you, you have uh, 10 minutes, not the normal five. Uh, and again, the uh, same applies to yourself as well, uh, Ms uh, Given. Um, so, all that considered, I will now ask uh, Mr. McBurney, Mr. McCallion, if you'd like uh, to take the opportunity to address the committee. As I said, uh, I'm trying to be as reasonable as I can, but obviously trying to manage uh, trying to manage the meeting here as best I can as well. Um, uh, but I'm not an unreasonable sort of person. I hope you'll appreciate that. Uh, so over to yourselves. You're very welcome. Um, and if you'd like to uh, now present to the committee. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that note on the uh, time period. We, we have prepared for five minutes, so, so hopefully we should be quite uh, short. Uh, good afternoon, committee. Um, we're here today to uh, submit that uh, permission should be granted contrary to the case officer's report and that the committee are personally entitled to do so. Um, simply put, if the committee goes with a recommendation of refusal, uh, a business will be lost, up to uh, 30 jobs will be lost in the local community. £750,000 in wages spent in the local rural community of Dalmana will be lost, uh, and then there will be knock-on impacts of other businesses uh, in the local area who source uh, sand from the applicant, and um, the letters have been opened to you um, from the officer. Um, as, and then finally, there will be negative impacts uh, in the wider economy from the removal of this uh, vital sand resource. Um, all of these are significant material planning considerations which have to be considered by the committee in the balance, and we would uh, uh, compel you to consider these. Um, contrary to the officer's report, um, the environmental information for the committee, including the submission of uh, August 2021, 20, uh, is uh, robust and specifically deals with the EIA case law, uh, which uh, permits the grant of permission to this application according to the EIA regulations. Um, that extensive case law was included within the environmental statement in 2020 and was repeated in correspondence. I think that was brought to your attention today. Um, and it was the case law that resulted in the principles you were referred to. But there was salient points within that case law which we've drawn out and explained why it's entirely permissible to grant approval for this application. Importantly, the applicant has not circumvented any of the requirements of the EIA directive as appears to be alleged but has rather spent many years and many hundreds of thousands of pounds uh, engaging in that process and fulfilling the requirements. In addition, the planning board details to outline the committee the precedent uh, decision of the Loch Ness Sand Traders, which was granted in January 21, after 80 years of extraction of mineral without the uh, benefit of planning permission, uh, the Independent Planning Police Commission and the Department for the Infrastructure uh, we're content to grant planning approval uh, to that development for a further 15 years of extraction and 22.5 million tonnes of sand from the bottom of Loch Ness. So it can be done. The law allows it to be done. And uh, that sets a very uh, significant precedent. 
In addition, the planning department, um, sorry, further, all of our one of the consultees offers no objection to the proposal. The sole consultee taking issue in noise grounds is confused to the requirements of the EIA regulations. My letter of the 1st of August 2022 details that. Uh, the specifics of my letter uh, of August 22 are not dealt with in the case officer's report, uh, which details at length um, the rebuttal of the position taken on noise and the errors within it. Um, the planning department has seeked to overrule its consultees in formulating its reasons for refusal, and they've been presented to you. I won't expand upon that. In addition, at a site in close proximity, uh, the planning department and the environmental health department has agreed in the noise condition permitting a level of 53 dB at a sensitive, sensitive receptor dwelling uh, in close proximity to that quarry. Uh, we've proposed 45 dB, but apparently that's not good enough. As a matter of fairness and consistency, I must highlight this point as it's entirely prejudicial to the applicant. It's worth noting that mineral extraction started on the site in September 2016 with the grant of planning permission. This application before you was launched in 2007, six years prior to the time limit for extraction ending. Um, the application has been with you now, or has been before the department and now the council for some 15 years to get to this point. The delays experienced by the applicant are now being used as a justification for refusal. The applicant is an established family business, which applies six years prior to the expiry of its permission, expecting to receive a planning decision, and it has not. Um, contrary to what you've heard today, the environmental statement has assessed all of the development from prior to the commencement, i.e. the baseline to completion, and any required amendment has been made. And it's very important to note that given this application was launched six years prior to the expiry, uh, of the lawful planning permission of, from which to extract them. The proposal that was applied for originally included all of the development to which the council was referred to, uh, and any issues that have arisen have been dealt with during the course of the application they've been referred to. So I'll pass over to Gareth. Thanks, Grant. Um, likewise, um, I hope to keep this very succinct, uh, Chair. Uh, it has been demonstrated to the satisfaction of the consultees uh, that the proposed development is fully compliant with the prevailing planning policy and the 23 hectare development area will not result in any significant environmental effects. The council's consultees have concurred with the applicants, environmental experts, and have not sustained any objections to the planning application CF4, as Grant has highlighted, the recently related responses on noise. However, even environmental health have in recent times supported the application subject to the attachment of planning conditions, including the hours of operation, noise limits at 45 dB, and an agreed dust management plan. There is no support uh, committee for the council's reasons for refusal from any of its statutory consultees, therefore any of the council's experts on mineral planning applications. The application has been accompanied by a phased geotechnical working and progressive restoration plans, which were updated uh, and resequenced in 2022, contrary to the case officer report, and are currently being followed. As outlined already, the economic need for the sustained mineral at this site has been clearly defined. 30 jobs and at least three quarters of a million pounds per annum will be lost locally to the Donna area. It has been demonstrated that there will be no or negligible impact, even better, on groundwater. And there is no risk of flooding. The development type, as demonstrated within the environmental statement, is compatible in terms of fluvial flooding, a position which has been confirmed by NIA and Rivers Agency, both custodians of the water environment. It has been demonstrated that the project will not cause harm to protected sites or habitat under the habitat regulations, and that has been confirmed also by NIA and the competent authority of shared environmental services. Standard conditions regarding archaeology have been agreed with HED. The landscape and visual impact were integral to the design and phasing when Quarry Plan took charge of this application in 2012. And the applicant's landscape architect has provided an assessment based not only on the A O B policy, but on MIN policy too. The key objective, and these key objectives are also outlined in the Council's draft 
uh, local development plan strategy, uh, the protection of the skyline and the relocation of the plant to fulfill that. There is no support from NIA or others for this reason for refusal. Regarding traffic, the applicant has demonstrated there will be no intensification of output levels. The output levels have been at 105,000 tonnes per annum as proposed at the outset and, have, and continue to be that. This position has been sustained by waiver receipts, which have been provided during the processing of this application, demonstrating compliance with those levels. And DFI roads have accepted the proposed access improvements self promoted by the applicants. Therefore, I would appeal to the committee that the very least to call for review of this case, given the clean bill of health provided by the consultee at not only a planning level, but an EIA level, and particularly considering the rawness with respect to the processing of mineral planning applications and assessing the economic implications with this refusal of this critical and locally strategic mineral development site. Thank you, committee. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, uh, please stay on with us. Uh, thanks for joining us again. Members, uh, again, I'm now going to open that up to yourselves. If you have any questions for either Mr. McBurney or Mr. Uh, McCallion, um, please now indicate either in the chat box or, of course, if you're in person, no, you're here in person here in the, in the chamber. So I'll give it a few seconds to see if anybody wants to ask any questions. Okay. Uh, so, uh, first indicated speaker, I have uh, Alderman Kerrigan and then Councillor Gallagher will come to you next. So, uh, go ahead, Alderman Kerrigan. Thank you very much, Chair, for allowing me in. And apologies, I'm just going back between the, the, the WebEx and the, 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 the notes. Um, I'm just, just querying here with, with, with the agents here on behalf of the applicant there. Um, this has dragged out quite a bit, and I say I, I was on site visit along with other members there stated, and it seems quite a while ago now. But um, are we still sitting here? Uh, your, uh, your view then, as a, as a uh, on behalf of the applicant there, that you have complied with everything, and you're stating effectively here that these ten reasons which are listed for refusal, as as far as I'm aware, I just couldn't get back into the pack. But is it the same? 10 reasons as was previously brought up um that that these 10 reasons are are null and void that you have ticked the box for every single one and that effectively they they, they should no longer be there that you have met all statutory and legal requirements there for it and again i i'm fully aware and again i know refusal reason two is 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 stating the demonstrate the economic need for the mineral resource outweigh and, and protect the conserve uh conserve the environment and I, and I take fully on board the importance of, of the, the employment that are provided not only directly but again the link in with the subcontractors and, and, and the wider and to the Dunham and the wider northwest area there and, and again take that on board entirely but I suppose the, the argument is going to be turned in it's planning reasons does it meet planning policy and I'm just clarifying with yourself that 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 uh, that, that that you're content that you have ticked the box for every element here uh, and if you could just elaborate on that, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thanks, uh, Alderman Kerrigan. Um, gentlemen, I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to present your observations in relation to that now. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Alderman Kerrigan, for the question. Uh, yes, we uh, we have completely ticked every box 100% with respect to planning policy. And that, is, that position has not been sustained just by uh, our position or the applicant's position, but by the statutory consultees who have offered no reasons for refusal. Uh, and I don't believe can sustain reasons for, for free refusal as presented. Uh, in terms of the 10 reasons for refusal, they remain exactly the same, uh, which has us perplexed given our submission of August uh, 2021, which we where we whereby we addressed all of the, the council's concerns or the planning officer's concerns uh, and, and provided the clarification necessary to address each and every reason for refusal. Although we note that only one reason for refusal has been uh, dropped, that being the mine waste plant. But we are of no, no doubt 
uh, my 22 years of mineral planning in Northern Ireland, this is a typical sand and gravel operation and can be addressed uh, and operated under typical standard planning conditions. Thank you for that. Uh, okay, you can tell with that answer, yep. uh, Alderman Kerrigan. Yeah, just a very quick supplementary, Chair. Just very, very quick on it, um, uh, if you'll allow. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. Very quickly. Uh, uh, just, just to, to grant on that. Uh, I, I, well, following on from that, and, and I accept that, and thank you very much for that re response there. Um, is it, is it something that you, you would feel because that seems to be a thing that's dragged out, and it is a thing. That, well, I'm not saying it's dragged out in whose fault or anything else, but I'm just stating, you know. We're still sitting with 10 reasons. Both of them are still the same as, as previous. We've had the site visits quite some time ago. As, uh, the, I'm just uh, stating, has there been much back and forward or, or proper discussion and sit down discussion between yourselves and the planners? And do you feel it would be of any benefit if this, because it's just there's 10 refusal reasons here and it's 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 a difficult one. And I'm just wondering, would it be, uh, do you feel there would be a benefit if you were given a month to uh, deferral and that you were stated to to uh, deal with, uh, 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 that you could have a proper discussion with the planners again? Would that be a benefit in your opinion? Thank you. Go ahead, gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Alderman. Um, in terms of, um... Our, our position is it's ready to be approved, but as you saw from my letter um, on Monday, I think, from memory, um, in terms of the level of engagement discussion, um, I, I can tell you, it, uh, as I know it, um, June, it was listed for um, refusal in 21. Um, that was adjourned for um, the committee to have a site visit, which occurred. We then put in a rebuttal submission to the case officer's report, which ran on the 89 pages. Um, in August, um, nothing happened, and that was then consulted upon in uh, January 21. That was kicked off, or sorry, 22. I then asked for a meeting in February, and the officer said, well, wait for all the responses to come back. So that meeting occurred the 10th of May. And then, uh, as my lender said, we got a letter saying, look, uh, given the passage of time since your last submission, um, we feel we should give you an opportunity to put something in if you wanted. Uh, and then I responded on the 1st of August, which I'd sent in to the committee, uh, which the paragraph 7, I said, if there's some material respect in which the council considers the information provided to be insufficient or out of date, uh, the council should clearly identify it, identify it as a matter of fairness and reasonable process. This should be done without further delay. Further on, there were other paragraphs within that letter. I got no response to that. However, uh, the applicant is open to discussions. Um, and if if the council were uh, uh, amenable to facilitate that, I think that discussion may be worthwhile. However, I, I would like to be told exactly the deficiencies, etc. Um, I can gain some of them from the case officer's report. But it's not like I've ever received the letter saying, like, well, here's the inadequacies, here's what we don't like. But certainly, certainly I think it, uh, I, I ask the applicant, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't dismiss the meeting. I think it could probably be positive, at least in serving to narrow the issues. Um, and hopefully that's a satisfactory answer. So, yes, we're, we're, we're open to a meeting and I've articulated the level of engagement that's occurred. Sorry, the last point would be that the premise of my letter of the 1st of August and, and was essentially that we're sitting with all the consultees back happy, but clearly the council weren't happy as we've now learned we seven days previous, but we hadn't had that articulated to us previous. Okay, thank you for that. All right, um, another indicated speaker in relation to this, uh, Councillor Geller. Thanks, Chair. Just a couple of quick ones uh, to the applicants. Is, is there currently other sites currently, as we speak, open and, and working? And has has uh, applicants uh, looked at alternative sites? We've talked about loss 
or loss of the of any alternative sites. Thank you, Councillor Gellar. Go ahead, gentlemen. Okay. Yes, I mean, we have considered um, all alternative sites within the locality of the planning application area, including those sites which are operated by Riddles Brothers. Uh, and we have outlined our position both in terms of the EIA, in terms of law, that we are only uh, permitted to provide studies of alternatives that have been reasonably considered by the, the applicant, and we have provided information based on Mr. Riddle's other sites, including Lupin Avenue uh, and the site at Gushaden, which I think is referred to as, as Kildog, as not being suitable replacement sites, as they will not yield the mineral uh, return that is required to sustain his business at 105,000 tonnes per annum, a basis on which he has built uh, his family business upon. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Gallagher, are you looking back in again? No? You happy enough? Right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Gallagher. Uh, I was trying to read your body language there. I wasn't telling me what you wanted me to, to do. Um, okay. Um, uh, Councillor McKinney. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, gentlemen, um, I'm just referring to one of the refusals, which was number eight. The proposal is currently to uh, to MIN 6, the planning strategy for rural. I'll not read the whole lot of it, but it says here, as insufficient information has been submitted to demonstrate the proposal has not and will not create environmental disturbance and unacceptable harm to the residents' community by residents by reason of dust. And then I say that you are proposing 20 plus vehicles to move 105,000 tonnes. Uh, and how many trips are these vehicles going to have to make? And how do you intend to cope with the dust that it will create? And also, um, does the company intend to set anything aside for your carbon footprint that you're going to be using? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McKinney. Go ahead, gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Councillor, for your question. Um, yes, I mean, we have considered all, all the vehicle movements all the activities and operations associated with the, the winning and working of minerals, the processing of that mineral, the relocation of the plant, including HDV movements, have been considered within uh, the environmental statement and including uh, the dust and the dust assessment. Um, we actually consider that, that element has been signed off uh, by the environmental health with the submission of our dust report. Uh, which uh, dust management plan, should I say, which is ongoing at the site and will continue to on to to, to be uh, promoted um, following the grant planning consent, uh, which includes uh, washing down of vehicles, uh, use of uh, washing, uh, we we wash facilities where applicable, dust suppression systems, um, and regular monitoring of of dust uh, emissions from the site. Um, inherently, sand and gravel sites are a, are a damp operation, made more so by the use of, of washing plant uh, and dust. Uh, hasn't been raised as, a, as an issue uh, with the levels not exceeding the, the recommended standards in uh, for Northern Ireland. Uh, but as I say, we have a, a dust management plan, which the local environment have, have signed off on, um, and they have uh, indeed taken elements of that plan and provided uh, conditions uh, such as the development shall be undertaken in strict adherence to the dust management plan uh, dated January 2018. Uh, during each phase of development, including site preparation, the applicant should undertake dust deposition and monitoring uh, at the locations agreed with the Environmental Health Service and the dust deposition rate of 200 milligrams uh, per meter square per day is, is not to be exceeded. Those levels have not been exceeded at this site. Uh, and, and that condition was stipulated down going forward. Uh, following any bond formation, the bond should be graded and, and seeded as soon as practical. All of these are standard uh, planning conditions which have been uh, taken from the dust management plan and, and put in into place. Um, so I think I, I think there is a, a, a dust has been fully considered and assessed by the, the competent authority uh, and signed off on. But thank you, Councillor. Okay. 
Anything further, Councillor McKinney? Go ahead. Um, okay, thank you very much for that sort of explanation, but you still really haven't answered on the other questions about the carbon footprint, how you tend to offset it, and also maybe you could explain to me the route in and the route out of the actual quarry. Now, I know the officer touched on it, but I'd like you to elaborate a bit more on it for me, please. Yeah, just just on, sorry, sorry just on the uh, the bottom, uh, I hold my hands up on the carbon footprint. Point, um, Riddles Brothers um, and the company um, generally will have a, a policy on that, but it would be open if the council so desired them to have a specific policy specifically to tie to this site and this permission if you so wish. If you're reminded to grant approval, they would be open to that. But the pass over to Gareth more on the um, access point. Yes, in relation to the access, um, the access uh, arrangement as is that which has been approved uh, under the 2006 planning consent, um, uh, and we are utilising that access going forward. Uh, so we exit the site uh, to the southeast, uh, cross over the Castle Warren Road uh, into uh, an existing uh, sand and gravel site and back out again onto the Castle Warren Road. Uh, that was the route that was proposed uh, under the 2006 planning consent, as I say, uh, and we've uh, and that route can and should be conditioned um, as part of this planning uh, consent. And, and, and if necessary, uh, if the route, if acceptable to the planning authority should be uh, agreed uh, as the as the sole means of access to and from the site. Thank you, Councillor. Hey, gentlemen, do you want to come back on again, Councillor McKinney? Um, Okay, yeah, thank you. so you're using the same route and same route out. Am I right in saying that? Yes. Go ahead. Yes, yes, that is correct. We're proposing to use the same route in and out. There's no additional uh, access points from, from the site as approved on the 2006 going forward. Okay, I think that might be the last question. Thank you, Councillor McKinney. Members, uh, anyone else like to? Direct any questions to the applicant? If not, I'm going to move us on. Just giving people the opportunity if they want to type anything in in relation to asking a question. The chat box, don't see anybody there. Nobody in the room here. Okay, members, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, of course. Uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to move on now, and uh, the next speaker uh, is actually um, here to speak on behalf of uh, Objector, um, and uh, that is Una Given. So, Una, again, you're very welcome. Thank you for uh, sticking with us through the afternoon. Uh, and again, uh, um, further to to um, the ruling I made at the start, I'll afford you uh, ten minutes if you want to use ten minutes. Um, but of course, if you want to keep it brief or not, we'd all uh, be happy enough with that as well. So again, uh, you're very welcome. And if you want to um, address the committee now, please do so. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm a planning consultant and I represent Robert and Isabel Brown of Castle Warren Road, whose home overlooks the site. We are fully in support of the recommendation to refuse planning permission. I would like to reiterate some issues that have been raised by the planners in their report and which support the recommendation to refuse. There are discrepancies in this planning application. The application proposes a phased approach to extraction with a progressive restoration. However, this cannot happen as extraction is already well underway in some areas, out of sequence with the plan that is before the Council and without the earlier phases having been restored. It is now very difficult for the planning authority to assess this proposal before it and to be able to ensure appropriate restoration through the application, and so it should be refused. A rock hammer and mobile crusher have been seen at the site, no doubt used in carrying out the works which have been done to date and for which planning permission is being sought. And yet this equipment has not been accounted for in the noise impact assessment. According to the application, the number of vehicles attending the site per day is 20. 
However, video evidence supplied by my client indicates a figure of around 30 per day, which supports the concerns regarding intensification in the use of a substandard access. I now turn to the relevance of the previous history on this site. When permission had been granted at the site in 2006 for sand and gravel extraction, it was on condition that extraction cease on the 30th of September 2013. The reason for the condition was to limit the duration of the development and in the interests of the amenity. Then in 2014, an application was made seeking permission for extraction to continue for another five or ten years, which was refused at appeal. The Plan Appeals Commission took the view that noise and activity on the site was not considered to be acceptable over an indefinite period and that continued extraction would unacceptably harm residential immunity. The Council's own Environmental and Health Department have confirmed on occasions that noise levels have exceeded the acceptable levels. And in their final consultation response this year, Environmental Health have stated, and I quote, noise from plant and machinery associated with this application is clearly audible in the external immunity space of the complainant's property and would have a negative impact on its use. It is the EHS view that there can be a loss of amenity at residential property due to noise, even though statutory nuisance has not been established. If you were to approve this application, it would defeat the purpose of granting the 2006 permission for a temporary period only, and which had given the residents the expectation that the residential immunity would be protected in the long term. In summary, the planning application has been with the planning authorities for 14 years, and in all that time, the applicant has not been able to prove that the proposal will not cause demonstrable harm to resident residential immunity by means of noise and dust, visual immunity, road safety, surface water flood risk, the natural and historic environment, groundwater, and the Sperrins area of outstanding natural beauty. Last year, the planning team brought it before the planning committee with a recommendation that it be refused. In the past 14 months, the applicant has had the opportunity to address the reasons for refusal as previously presented, and the application has been subject to further scrutiny, but the same 10 reasons are before you today. The Council has been more than fair and accommodating to the applicant who has the right to appeal the Council's decision. And that is an option that is not available to the residential population who have been impacted by the development. I'd also point out that the majority of the letters of objection and all of the signatures on the two petitions of objection are from local residents, whereas the few letters of support are not from people living in the area. The Council issued an enforcement notice in 2018 with respect to this development. It is now time for the Council to demonstrate its authority again and act decisively by refusing this application here today. And ladies and gentlemen, that, that completes my presentation and, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Una, and thank you for your time as well. Again, um, Una, have you just... Um... Stay there for a minute, obviously. Uh, members, open it up the floor again. Anybody, any questions for Una, either here in the room or online? First question from Councillor McKinney. Councillor McKinney. Uh, Una, thank you for coming on and uh, speaking on behalf of the objectors. Um, you, you stated there about the substandard access to the plant. Could you elaborate on that for me, please? Go ahead, Una. I've raised the issue of the substandard access because it's a matter of raised by road service and the substandard access beco becomes relevant where there's an intensification in the use of that their access. And that is why we have put additional information in with regards to the number of vehicles that are attending the site every day. Um, according to the applicant's application form, they have considered that there'd be 20 good vehicles per day visiting the site. But my uh, client has video footage of the site that he recorded in 2017 and in 2018, in which he recorded over a period of 27 you know, full days, 
the uh, movements at the site. And that video footage was examined frame by frame uh, by my client and checked by myself. And the average number of vehicles visiting the site was around 30. So there will be an intensification in the use of the access. And that's why you know, the, the quality of the existing access is relevant. I have another question there. Um, I see from the letter from Mr. Brown that uh, he says there that his um, let me just read it, outdoor recreational space is simply no Gloria. Um, could you want to elaborate on that for him? Go ahead on that. Sorry, Una. Uh, you're going at full tilt, but unfortunately, uh, you're on mute there. Um, the catches us all. We're all well used to it by this stage, of course. Uh, so, if you'd like to answer that in relation to um, the outdoor immunity mentioned in, in uh, the objector's letter to the committee. Beg your pardon. Um, the, that, that is an issue that you know Mr. Brown can express on himself. But in addition to that, there, the council's own environmental health department, they have assessed the noise at um, Mr. Brown's property and the outdoor amenity space. And there has been occasions where the noise from the existing unauthorized works, which are the subject of this application, that they have exceeded the 45 decibel uh, recommended acceptable level. So that, and they have confirmed that it would have an impact on his immunity. And in just in terms of Mr. Brown's own perception of the noise, there has been occasions where him and his wife, they have just simply left their house for the day and went off for a day out because it, it, it was just too troublesome to be in their own home. And I think that is probably the most damning thing to hear. And that is something, again, that is, is unique about Mr. Brown's um, uh, presentation. Only Mr. Brown and his wife can, can know what it is like to experience the noise at their property. It, it doesn't matter, you know, how many reports that are done or what, you know, whatever expert might say, it is having an effect on their quality of life. And he, he did allude to their um, to their health as well in his uh, submission. And it is it is a, a damning indictment when Mr. and Mrs. Brown have to leave their house of a day and find something else to do because they just can't bear the noise. And environmental health have confirmed that the noise level have exceeded the um what was considered to be the acceptable level at their outdoor amenity space. Thank you, Una. And uh Councillor McKinney's indicated that he's content with that answer. Um next indicated speaker, um uh Alderman Kerrigan. Thank you very much, Chair, for allowing me in and thank you, Una, for for uh uh, putting forward the, uh, on behalf of the objectors. Just a couple of wee points of clarification there, Una. Uh, uh, just just remind me there, and, and you did state the figures there in regards to, to Councillor McKinney, and I was uh, I was right in there, and I missed your first figure. The, you'd stated that there were 30 vehicles, and on average, 30 vehicles that you had recorded, or you had, you had viewed as well the same footage which Mr. Brown had recorded there in regards to accessing the site. Um, I'm assuming is that is that thir that's thirty vehicles. You, you know that's not just like fifteen in, fifteen out again, or that's this is thirty individual trips where vehicles are entering and exiting the the site. And just confirm to me there. I know it's in the report, but just just if you can confirm to me, is it is it twenty was what was stated should be the, the figure? Or just if you can con confirm to me that. Uh, then um, I have another couple of wee points in here. The uh, you have stated as well the 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 noise levels and exceeding the acceptable levels. Uh, can you confirm to me is there the, the what what as I say I, I figures here, but I'm going to ask you and I'll ask the planning officer as well. Um, what what levels or, or are you just basing this on what what is what council are putting forward or uh in regards to the noise levels is that something which which your client has or, or that they've exceeded the levels or are you going on the basis of what the planning officers have brought forward in their report as a second question um 
another two questions, and and then I, I, I'll let you if you're content. I just when I'm on my wee spree, I'll just rattle on here. Um, the the you did mention in regards to a rock hammer and a mobile crusher uh, entering the site. Um, yeah, and I mean that would be items that would be on a a quarry base site. W- would they have been uh, definitely going to you know that's a large site? Is it is it? Uh, Maybe I'm wrong. Is it forty hectares, or it's a large site? There were they going in particular? Is there any evidence of which location they were there, or or how long they were there, or were they just noted on the site? What is it the case that they were going to a certain section of the site? Would they have been going to a section where we're in, we're in discussion here in this planning, or because of the size of the site, are they going somewhere else? Um, and the last one there, uh, the last wee point that I have at present here in a, is. What engagement, if any, has there been between the objectors and the applicant? And and is there what what sort of to and fro has there been actually with the applicant applicants and and the the objectors who are speaking on behalf? So if you could just g- give me a wee response to them, and much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Kerrigan. Um, uh, thanks for grouping all the questions and together. Uh, Una, I hope you you managed to pick up on all of those questions. If you, if you feel that you didn't, of course, feel free to. Um, to ask uh, again, um, but uh, it's over to yourself. Okay, I, I think I think I've got the gist of the four of them, but sure, uh, if if I'm up, or having said the right thing, you know, maybe just give me a prompt and uh, I'll, I'll provide clarification. The first question was seeking clarification on the number of vehicles and the vehicles that we had recorded at the site and the number of vehicles that were presented on the on the application. Had given you that was an average of 30 vehicles leaving the site every day. And the number that's given in the applicant's um, application form, um, the question in the application form is sorry, I know you've gone on mute again. We've just Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. Go ahead. Inadvertently, sorry. I'll just repeat it. Um, I start my start, I think, and then we can be sure we got everything. Uh, in terms of the number of vehicles, goods vehicles attending the site, um, in my presentation, I have compared like with like. The applicant on their P1 form, they have said that 20 good vehicles will be attending the site. And in the evidence that we provided, um, Mr. Brown uh, videoed the site and we give a, a figure of 30 vehicles leaving the site. So that doesn't count mo- movements in. We observed thir- an average of 30 leaving the site. So I, I think that we are comparing like with like in terms of the figures. So the number of vehicles attending the site in reality certainly. Uh, according to Mr. Brown's evidence, as well in excess than what is predicted on the planning application form. Um, I was going to go on to the second question, which was the noise, if that's OK. Um, the second question was the, um, the actual uh, the noise levels and that they were exceeded at Mr. Brown's property. Um, as far as I know, that there is a recommendation in the applicant's evidence that the recommended noise levels would not exceed 45 decibels. And you know, as we heard from the applicant's representatives today, you know, they were suggesting a condition to that effect. So that that is the figure that has been exceeded at Mr. Brown's property. It's the 45 decibels which is being recommended as the acceptable figure according to the applicant's um, uh, reports. The third question uh, was to do with the the location of the rock hammer and stone crusher on the site. Um, I've not witnessed these myself and I wouldn't mind maybe if the planning officer would provide clarification to that effect because in her presentation, there was quite good photographs provided showing the location of the rock, um, the rock hammer and stone crusher. And maybe the planning officer could confirm if they were in areas of the site that are subject of the application. 
the application area, I mean, it is a very extensive area and there's only a very, very small part that is, um, is, is lawful now at this stage. And I would, you know, unless that rock hammer and that stone crusher was exactly in that area that is lawful, um, I would assume that the rock hammer and stone crusher were used in the um, development of the operations that are subject of the planning application. Um, the fourth question was in relation to any relationship or any discussions or, or engagement between the applicant and the uh, objector. Um, that would be more a question, I have to say, for Mr Brown himself, but not that I am aware of. Has there been anything particular uh, between the applicant and the objector? Um, I hope that answers your questions and uh, I'm happy to take supplementary questions if I haven't answered you right. Thank you, Yuna. And Alderman Kerrigan has indicated that he uh, has one fo further follow up question. So. Um, again, over to yourself, Alderman Kerrigan. Thank you very much, Chair, and I will be very brief. And I do thank you enough for for, resp for your response there. Just just one little point or one one little qu query: the 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 vehicles. So we are effectively then you're saying there's fifty percent more vehicles being on average thirty a day rather than twenty a day. And just seeking clarification, you did state that that was recorded in twenty seventeen, five years ago. Would that be correct? I'm just just seek, uh, we just for a point of clarification. Thank you. Thank you, That's Go ahead, Anna. 2017 and 2018. Okay, thank you. Straightforward. Uh, answer. Uh, any other members got any questions for the objector? Uh, bear with me. Tomorrow. Uh, there was, I think there was one question Alderman Kerrigan asked that he wanted to address the officers, but can we just let me go through with the objector first and then perhaps you can come back and answer that when we get to your, your part of the, um, the process, Suzanne, okay. Um, so any other questions for the objectors, members? Going once, going twice. Right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Una. Um, that's all the questions we have for you. Um, here, of course, please stick around. Um, so, members, moving along to the next part of the whole thing. Uh, and, of course, you'll all be aware. I appreciate that um, you can now put questions to council officers uh, in relation to the report, um, uh, the verbal report, etc., etc. So, again, I'll open it up to members of the committee for any questions, observations, or whatsoever you may feel is appropriate. I have one person in the chat box. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Dobbins. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Chair, it's with regard to the, the noise uh, levels. And I think earlier on you had said there was, Kieran was on the line and also our uh, environmental officer was on the line. I think it's unacceptable that people have to leave their homes uh, just to get peace and quiet. So therefore, I would like either our planning officers, our enforcement officer, or envir our environmental officer to to sort of verify um, that these uh, these measures or th th this noise level and uh, dust level has been measured and they can sort of verify what um, the objectors are actually saying. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dobbins. Um, I had a similar query myself, actually, in, in relation to that as well. Uh, so uh, before I... Uh, ask um, officers to to uh, address that matter. My, I may as well uh, ask my question to you, Angela, because it's it's very similar, and and I suppose it's to the environmental health 
department representative here, Paul. Paul, um, and um, Paul, what would normally in, a, in, a, in cases like this be considered reasonable or appropriate decibel level? Um, uh, and then what kind of levels were we talking about upon investigation uh, and inspection of the site? Um, and in layman's terms, what would the variance mean for us when we're considering this? If there is indeed a variance, um, uh, um, I suspect obviously the report suggests that there is, so there must have been of some sort. Uh, that's my question, and it's allied to um, part of Councillor Dobbins' question as well. Um, and also for officers, can you can you also walk us through the PAC part of that report again uh, and the refusal of permission um, uh, in 2015 um, and what exactly it was that was refused? Uh, it's a very long, it's a very lengthy report, and some some of it you, you're going back and forward, and I'm sure you'll appreciate. Um, it, it wasn't evident to me, certainly, you know. So um, that's an that's a question for yourself as well, Suzanne. So, a couple of questions for officers just to get the ball rolling there. Thanks, Angela. I think Paul is going to come in on the noise. I'll come in on the dust and the PAC. Um, thank you. Just for the questions, um, councillors. Um, in terms of noise levels. Um, in terms of this type of facility, there's no. Yeah, uh, see the note there, lean forward a bit. Um, so there's no specific guidance within Northern Ireland, but what we tend to refer to is what's called the National Planning Framework in the UK, England. And the guidance for standards for noise from mineral development talks about establishing baseline conditions, i.e., background noise levels. Um, and the recommendation is there that any limit should be set in accordance with those baseline levels. And we've heard the level 45 being um, mentioned, and that's contained within the applicant's consultant report and ourselves over a period of time, um, taking baseline measurements at noise sensitive receptors that um, uh, was shown in the, um, the report earlier on. And as such, then uh, that's how the limits established. So, generally speaking, 35 dB background without the plant, and then subsequently adding 10 B, 10 dB establishes a limit value at that property. Um, and that's usually quite generous because the nature of mineral development being noisier uh, than most other types of activity that's taking place outside as well. But also, um, it's worth noting that the background can vary over time as well. Um, but generally speaking, we're talking about typical background levels. Um, so there may be quieter periods than it's less than 35. But generally speaking, over a longer term measurement, the baseline is established. And that's been done in this case by the applicant through his consultant. So we have received complaints from uh, the local resident and we've been out and monitored noise levels. And likewise, we've heard from them that um, they've had to leave their house because of noise. So you just generally at the front of the property, there's a front amenity space. We'll set up noise equipment and measure for a period of time to establish the noise level. So as well as the that 45 dB level that uh, was established as part of the uh, assessment, you do hear other noise sources. So when you're standing or sitting and you're trying to enjoy your front garden, you're not distinguishing, you know, you don't know whether it's a, you know, the washing plant because it's fairly consistent, but you will get other noises associated with uh, rock pressures, metal buckets rattling, reversion alarms going. So you're not, as a, as a resident, you're hearing everything. And uh, I suppose what we have said in our comment, and I know um, there's comments already been made by the applicant in relation to our approach, is that um, we would have considered that all those sources of noise, including whatever rock hammers or mobile crushers, mobile screeners that might come on to the site should have been assessed and shown if they could uh, meet the 45 dB limit. 
the difficulty for us is that when we're out on site, um, we're getting exceedances of that 45 dB limit. So how can we have confidence you know, in that condition and um, be met by the proposal in front of us? So I, I don't know if I've mentioned everything there, but essentially 45, it is, uh, there was historical old guidance we were planning gains that was withdrawn, albeit some time back, but it did suggest that it would be unreasonable to set a limit less than 45 dB for mineral development. Now, obviously, that's superseded by the newer gains. So, again, it sort of ties in with the background 35, but 45. But as I say, um, you hear the washing plant and associated other plant at the residence amenity space and when we exclude the passing traffic on the road in front of them um, we're getting levels maybe 47 to 50 at times um, and we've had to approach them on occasions which they have done to uh, move crushing plant from the site which was at one point causing the levels of 52 to 53 decibels at the residential property just for clarity well for my own benefit and perhaps others as well. Can you, there was a, something you said there, if you exclude um, traffic movement, not necessarily the, the lorries and stuff like that, but is it ordinary traffic that we're thinking about as well as, as, as that? But even if, if you exclude that, then the DB level was above 45. Is that correct? Is that what you just said? Yeah. Yeah, the recent measurements I took myself, um, the levels um, with, with the traffic excluded, i.e. passing in front of the property, the level was 47 dB in the front garden in the amenity space, related to 10 cars and vans passing over a period of an hour. All right. No, that's Grant. No, thanks for clearing that up for me. I thought that's what you said. Um, sometimes the audio one here is not the best. Uh, in terms of the speakers, and sometimes my hearing lets me down, so th thanks for clearing that up. Um, so, Suzanne, uh, I'm going to pass back those other questions to yourself. Uh, and then you, I think you said Kieran as well, is that right? Uh, you? Just, just you. Okay, sorry, Kieran. Um, okay, thanks, Chair. Um, in relation to Councillor Dobbins' query on the dust, um, clearly within the report, obviously, there has been a dust mitigation information has been submitted. Um, and that's, however, it's the effectiveness of that, those proposals that we are we have the difficulty with. Um, and environmental health did note that obviously, you know, there were no dust mitigation measures proposed to avoid track out from off-site transportation, um, such as an effective wheel or vehicle washer. There are two wheel washers located along the whole route. I've driven past them a number of times, but the effectiveness of them is, is the issue. Obviously, we have the objections, which are citing the, the real concerns that are happening from time to time on um, you know, properties, windows, cars, um, and you know, the, there's no sound and effective improvements um, to, that are being proposed to deal with this. So that is the reason why the information to date does not prevent, does not present effective dust control measures um, in our view. And, you know, dust of those effective measures are um, real issues in term in, in MIN 6, the planning strategy, and also in the Straban area plan because of its detrimental impact on residential amenity. With regard to the previous Planning Appeals Commission um, decision, so there was an application lodged, uh, J2014-0267, and that was to um, extract without complying with three conditions on the original permission. Those three conditions were condition one, which was the extraction period, which was to cease uh, in, on September 2013. Um, the other one was so that on that date, within six months of that date, that all machinery structures, buildings shall be removed. And the third condition, condition 21, was that the time period, after six months after the expiry of the time period, that the excavated area would be levelled and graded. So the applicant cho chose to go down the non-determination route with the Plan Appeals Commission. 
and assess the issues. Um, and ultimately, the crux of it was um, in relation to noise. Okay. Um, you know, both the planning authority and third parties raised the matter of the impact on residential amenity through noise and dust arising from the extraction activity. Um, you know, the you know the PAC did note that the department placed no noise limitations on the original approval. Uh, there was just a condition, um, but obviously the prolonged uh, exposure to higher levels, which the commissioner cited, um, they had experienced from normal activities on the site would unacceptably adversely impact on the amenity of residents. So these are doesn't have you know not statutory noise nuisance levels that are, you know which which would require this you know the abatement or whatever but other prolonged higher levels which we referred to in the report um, and for that reason they um the, the appeal was refused and the other conditions um followed suit so that is really the summary of and they also considered the economics an economic case was put forward at that time as well by the applicants team um, but they said that they were not persuaded that the economic case outweighed the objection to the development in terms of the harm to the immediate of the residents in the locality of the site okay thank you um just before i move on i have a couple of uh, other indicated speakers so i see you there in the chat box alderman kerrigan but bear with me a second um question directed to you, Suzanne, was from um, uh, Councillor Dobbins. So um, again, I'm just going to um, ask Councillor Dobbins uh, if she can tend to move on with that answer. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Paul, um, sorry, my question was directed as Paul, uh, Paul as well. Um, just want to, to ask, was there, I know this was an outdoor um, collection of noise, if you know what I mean, or monitoring of noise. That was done. Was there an indoor one as well done, um, Paul? Um, and you had, I say, say a thirty-five to forty-five decibels was usually quite generous. Um, so I, I would like to know, was there one done inside that home? And uh, as for Suzanne, the the dust, you had said um, the PAC in two thousand and fourteen, yet. Uh, uh, reason one, extract, extraction uh, cessation in 2013. Um, so the PAC was was after um, these three points had to be done. And as for wheel washing, yeah, it's, it's ineffective. Um, and I know that developers can't rely on um, or aren't responsible for dry weather and all that there, but wheel washing is not the only way of getting rid of um, dust. So um, I thank you for your for your uh, response there. But could I just get Paul to come back on that one? Thanks, Chair. Yeah, um, it's just when I, I meant 35 is the background noise level, you know, for without plant operating. And that's been established by taking noise measurements over a period of time uh, at different noise receptors. Um, but as I said, indicated earlier that that's the typical background noise level, certainly like the, the one that occurs most often. Whereas, you know, you go all get quieter periods of time when the background noise level will drop a bit. In relation to internal noise measurements, yeah, we have monitored noise um, internally as well. Um, there's no specific guidance in relation to noise from mineral works. There is general guidance in World Health Organization. Um, documents and we haven't been able to establish nuisance using those internal noise levels uh, within the property. Uh, but there's mineral guidance specifically is about external noise levels in amenity spaces. Thank you, Chair. Yep, thank you, Councillor Dobbins. Um, Suzanne, there was one question as well that <clears throat> Alderman Kerrigan asked when he was when he was talking to the um, agent on behalf of the objectors which was something in relation to the location of the crushers and the washers and stuff like that so maybe we could put we could put that up on a on a map for alderman kerrigan however he's on the list of speakers um anyway so we'll, we'll, we may be coming around to that in a, in a minute again alderman kerrigan if, if that's okay uh but councillor gallagher um you indicated here that you you want to go for it so go ahead 
Thank you That's to the officer. Uh, I'm wondering, could you possibly maybe elaborate? Like, there's been a lot of unauthorised, uh, unlawful works that have taken place on the site for many years. And there's an, a need to demonstrate around when making an application to, uh, that there hasn't been or will not be an unfair disadvantage given. So the developer needed to, to demonstrate that under uh, Section 4 of Regulation 4. And, and that hasn't happened. I'm, I wonder, could you elaborate just further on that? Okay, thanks, Chair Councillor Gallagher. Um, yes, the requirement within the EIA in terms of the legal principles does require the developer to um, demonstrate that there's no unfair advantage. That has not been demonstrated because the agent team do not accept Council's position in terms of the recommendation we've come to regarding that. Um, and you'll see that on the correspondence that has been received today. Um, but that that has not been demonstrated um, to council at, at any time. You okay with that? No supplementary then? No? Okay, thank you, Councillor Gallagher. Um, and as I said, I was flagging up that, if you want to find that map for us, um, but you're going to get another question shortly, so, um, or maybe a couple more. Uh, Alderman Kerry, can go ahead. Thank you very much, Chair, for allowing me in. Apologies, I'm on the, on the phone at present, iPads about today. Uh, uh, just a couple of wee points there, and I'll summarise them here, put them all together, and, and whoever wishes to answer can, can respond. Uh, excuse me. There was a, a claim made at the, at the start uh, by the um, applicants, or on behalf of the applicants, and I know it's a different application, uh, and it wasn't clarified as which one, but uh, for a level of uh, a, a level playing field and even across the line, there was a claim stated that there was an application to do with quarrying or mining uh, where a 53 decibel limit was allowed by this council. Now, uh, if the officers can confirm if that's the case, and if that is the case, why is the 53 decibel limit allowed on one site and a 45 is not allowed on this site? You, you know, so just to be leave, uh, level and, and fair with everyone here. So maybe, as I say, every application is on its own. But, you, you know, uh, from what has been stated by, by the other officer there, you know, it's been stated that, that these levels have been 47 to 50. But yet we're, we're told that, you know, it's over the 45, which it stated, but yet a 53 is allowed somewhere else. 47 to 50 still within, under that. So um, just a bit of clarification on that one. Um, as, as, as well as that, Chair, the, um, right, that's the noise levels. The uh, access intensif intensification, yes, and has been stated there. And in regards to the, the vehicles, do the officers have any comments in regards to what was stated by the objectors in regards to 30 vehicles a day, which they're stating, and 20 vehicles a day, which had been stated as what, was, what it was going to be. And again, with the passage of time, that I believe was recorded in 2017 into the start of 2018. And again, was there any seeking to, to, to verify that position, such as seeking to get the, you know, the Weybridge dockets, as what lorries is coming in and out. I mean, they'd all have to be put onto the, lorry, onto, onto the Weybridge before they believe in, if they're going well load. So uh, just if there's any... If, if the planning officers have any uh, support and evidence for that. Um, the, I, I know it has been raised, and again, you've touched on it, Chair, anyway, the pictures and in regards to the crushers, and it is, it is a large site. And again, uh, the, the site this has been difficult. What's been, what sections of it has been, are still technically with planning permission or what, and what are without planning permission. But again, a comment which I would have and which has been stated is that uh, the, the, the applicants put in Planning permissions was it six years prior to their to their permissions were expiring, and and you know this whole system has been in the planning system is it 14 years now, you know and to be fair uh, to to our planners and and I am I'm, I'm being fair but you you'll know yourself chair when we look at the the um, the um, the applications from our council area which are with the Planning Appeals Commission there is a high number of them are dealing with either quarrying of some description, 
you know, uh, you, you know, and it seems to be a common thing that they take a long time. You know, I know one local to me that I can effectively almost see from my one day here, which is, uh, you know, kicked about for seven years now, and it's with the Planning Appeals Commission now. So, as I say, it's, it's, there seems to be a wee bit of an ongoing thing where planning applications for quarries are not straightforward and not simple, and they take time. So, uh, just a point on that then about the, the, the process of time that it has taken. Um, the other two things, and I'll be very brief, Chair. Um, Right, the, the, the um, engagement of the planners... And Alderman, the Alderman, Alderman, Alderman Craig, and can we keep the questions briefer, please? Um, uh, uh, and also, you are the one who said your battery was running low, so you may want to consider that. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll give a wee bit more leeway, Alderman Craig. Thank you, Chair. A very brief, two very sentences, two quick sentences. My iPad has died, but the, the phone landline's still going. Uh, the, uh, what engagement has yeah, there been... Yeah, you keep going the rate you're going, Alderman Kerrigan, and the phone battery will die as well, but only anyway, go ahead. Sorry for that. I couldn't resist it. Good man yourself, Chair. The engagement with planners and applicants, uh, in the planners' opinion, would it be would there be any benefit to a deferral for a month to actually have a sit-down, uh, a discussion between planners and the applicant? Can they get these issues ironed out? Because we're still sitting effectively, as far as I see, with the same 10 uh, refusal reasons. And the last question is, given the length of time this has taken and, and given the, the, the whole process, how long it's been in here and the complexity, should this not have been an application that should have had a predetermination here? Uh, so that's that's my few questions there. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Alderman Kerrigan. Um, uh, quite a number of questions there. Uh, so bear with us, uh, Councillor Barr. Um, uh, Suzanne, uh, back to yourself. Thanks, Chair. Okay, Councillor Kerrigan, I'll start at the beginning. Um, in relation to the earlier query you had on the location of the rock hammer and the crusher, uh, both myself and Karen Rogers visited the site on the 14th of April. We witnessed the rock hammer, and I'm just, if you can see my icon moving here, um, within phase 1A, which straddles the the actual hall road. The rock hammer was located in here. That was the picture we took. That is the area of rock underneath, which is referred to and the environmental information that lies in the southeast of the site. Um, and uh, the crusher was here. There have also been crushers witnessed throughout the site uh, on a number of occasions. Um, and we have evidence of that um, as part of our enforcement position. Um, in relation to the, I'll come back, Paul is going to deal with the issue with the quarry uh, and the other approvals uh, in terms of the, the higher noise limit. In terms of the access, so we'll come back to him, in terms of the access intensification, I mean, it's, it's quite clear in the report, we are uh, not content that there is no intensification, um, given the scale of the operation and given the, um, the, traffic, in, the traffic assessment information that has been submitted. The Department of Infrastructure have, have obviously referred that back to Council because intensification is, is our consideration um, and our reason for refusal is very clear on that. In terms of verifying the, you know, with weight receipts, uh, this, that and the other, you know, we are looking at a, we are looking at a site here at the minute whereby we do not have uh, in the environmental information any updated position in terms of the time period. Um, you know, and obviously that's dependent on lots of factors, you know, in terms of the economic uh, position as well. So, um, you know, but we, we would not be in a position to start verifying um, travel in and out of the site at the moment. Uh, the traffic assessment should consider um, all aspects of the development um, and peaks and troughs. In terms of what is on the site with or without plan permission, um, my slide here just in front of you, everything on the site currently does nothing has planned permission bar part of the hall road that's lawful, um, part of a number of settlement lagoons. Um, this area here and shaded yellow is lawful. Everything else um, is, is does not have you know there's there's no permission. Everything else is unauthorized. 
Um, yes, it has been in the system a long time. In terms of engagement with officers, um, you know, members will be aware that there was a full report published in June last year, um, which the applicant team then submitted their rebuttal to in, in August. Um, those matters were fully reconsidered. Um, officers considered they didn't. Uh, bar the mine and waste plan issues, there was nothing else that uh, could change because Ultimately, those legal principles in terms of the environmental information have not been met. Um, in terms of the deferral for the month, um, you know, I, I, I don't see how that will, you know, change the position in terms of those legal principles. The agent team are very clear they do not agree with council's position on that, um, and I would not be recommending that we would defer the application any longer, given the concerns the agents have put in as well in terms of the length of time it has taken council to defer that to to deal with the application. Um, so I wouldn't be um, proposing to defer it. For any longer, as, as Mr McBurney also indicated. Uh, in terms of the length of time it's been in the system in PDH, I mean, obviously there are a wide range of issues. Um, it's a large site, um, but it, it is not, not an application that, um, you know, a, a PDH was a consideration on. Um, and um, that is the conclusion we reached on that. In terms of the, so I'll pass over to Paul now, just in terms of the other uh, approval in the area. No, thank you, um, Councillor Carrigan, for your question. Um, the, the site that is referred to there um, is a, a nearby quarry site as well. Likewise, uh, background noise levels were established at different receptors, and uh, that plus 10 dB limit was applied, except to one receptor, which was referred to, where the levels were 53. Um, that receptor was financially involved with the um, application and had an interest. So even though there was a, a, a higher level of B, that the assessment included extraction and assessment of crushing on site. Um, it was felt we needed a, at least put a 55 dB maximum limit even for that site as well. All other receptors who weren't financially um, connected were subject to a limit of plus 10 dB above the background. Thank you. Well, that answers that question. Okay. Um, Councillor uh, Raymond Barr. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I haven't any questions, Chair, but I'd just like to uh, express a viewpoint. I'm duty planning on, on, on finding the amount of information. We have to digest Daunton, to say the least. But after reading the report and listening to the officers' presentations, it would appear to me there was quite a bit of disregard for regulations and a lack of willingness to comply in this case, and also a very dismissive approach to residents' concerns. However, I find this common on a lot of extraction issues, but for me, health, environment and quality of life will always take precedence over anything else. And obviously, that's why planning regulations are in place. And in this case, I don't think they've been here that here to. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Barr. Um, thanks for that. Uh, he's left, I think that's everybody. Um, unless there's anybody else in the room here, no. I don't see anybody online either. Um, I, uh, go ahead, Councillor Gallagher. Chair, just uh, that's concluded. No, okay then. No, not quite. Councillor Gallagher, I've, I've got my own. Final question I want to ask myself. I'm, I'm always reluctant to ask questions. I usually try to leave myself to the end. I know it doesn't always happen, but um, just in relation to the, um, again, it's just for, that's a, that's a, that's a clarity. I'm fairly sure I understood the answer, but uh, when um, Alderman Kerrigan asked about the crusher stroke washer, and you pointed out on the map there, um, where uh, they were seen to be by the enforcement team and yourself. And uh, I, I would be right in saying this, uh, would I? Correct me if I'm wrong. So these were in areas that had no planning approval and had therefore uh, were in areas that were unauthorized for those crushers and washers to be in. Is that correct? Yeah, so just to clarify, Councillor Boyle, firstly, um, the equipment that has been proposed as part of the environmental information, which I think is included in the noise section, 
uh, does not include the rock hammer or the the mobile crushers. Okay, and the issue is those 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 that those pieces of equipment have not been included within the cumulative noise assessment. Okay, so in terms of the environmental information, what has been used, what is required to be used to actually quarry the site at the minute because there's rock in those areas, 1A and 1B, um, have not been included in the environmental information. Um, and those areas are currently, um, the majority of those areas are unauthorised. Okay, there's no there's no permission on the ground at the minute to extract from the original permission because it expired in 2013. So the original permission, um, the time period for extraction has expired. Anything coming out of that or existing permission in the centre of the site is unauthorised. Um, and those areas, 1A and 1B to the southeast, are also unauthorised. Okay, well, uh, thanks for that. Suzanne, that clears that up for me. Um, Nobody else, anything? Uh, I'll open it back over to yourself, Councillor Gallagher. Thank you, Chair. I, everyone has finished. I, I would like to propose that we go with the officer's recommendation. Okay, members, um, proposal from uh, Councillor Gallagher uh, to uh, accept the officer's recommendation, which is obviously for uh, refusal. Councillor McKinney, I, of course, need a seconder. Yeah, Chair, I'll second. Yeah. Nobody else does. I was just about to say I would second the proposal. Okay, we'll take that as a second from uh, Councillor McKinney. It was partially my fault that I interrupted as he was trying to open his microphone. But again, thank you to the to Councillor Dobbins as well. So, members. Uh, Chair, can, can I just ask a question, the solicitor? I should, go ahead, Patricia. We, we haven't taken a vote yet. Look at it. Look at it. See the the representation that has been received. There's a lot of. Uh, um, notification about you know the fairness of process etc can you give us uh from <clears throat> legal point of view um I, I just want to know what's your opinion uh, chair through you obviously i'll not go into detail um in relation to it but i can confirm that i have seen the correspondence and um, that we have considered it as officers and indeed i have subsequently considered it and spoken to the um applicants uh, solicitor in relation to it uh, and that um as an officer team we are content to proceed okay yeah Better not got microphone off there, Councillor. Thank you. Um, uh, right, that's that answered as well. Okay, so we were we were on the process of of, of going to uh, the vote. We have a proposal uh, from Councillor Gallagher, uh, seconded by uh, Councillor McKinney. So um, I don't think we need to delay the process any further. Maura, if you would like to uh, take us through the vote. Thank you, Chair. Members, this is item three, and it's a recorded vote for um, proposal to accept the officer's recommendation. Alderman Alan Breslin. Yes. Thanks, Alan. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Against Mara. Thank you. Alderman Drew Thompson. Against Mara. Thank you. Councillor Jason Barr, as apologies. Councillor Raymond Barr. For. Thank you. Councillor John Boyle. For. Thank you. Councillor Angela Dobbins. For Maura. Thanks, Angela. Councillor Paul Gallagher. For. Thank you. Councillor Christopher Jackson. For. Thank you. Councillor Dan Kelly. I've seen Dan on. Dan, how are you? Yep. Councillor Kelly. I'll come back. Councillor Patricia Logue. For. Thank you, Patricia. Councillor Keir Maguire. Against for. Thank you. Um, Councillor Philip McKinney. For Maura. And Councillor Sean Minnie. For. Thank you. And just go back to Councillor Kelly. Councillor Kelly. I don't think Councillor Kelly was on the phone. He's off. He's on earlier. Thank you.
Chair, that's it for um, for against. Thank you, Maura. Um, okay, you all heard that. Um, eight for the uh, officer recommendation, four against uh, the op officer recommendation. Uh, so obviously that means that that's that's carried forward. Can I just, uh, on behalf of um, everyone and the, and the planning committee, uh, thank all of those who presented to us uh, here this afternoon. Uh, uh, that of course includes everybody on behalf of the uh, applicant, um, uh, the agents, etc., uh, and of course objectors and, and council, uh, council team for for addressing this. Members, uh, I'm just going to take a wee minute to uh, consider something here with some officers, and then um, I'll come back to you because I'm kind of looking at the clock at this point uh, as well. So just bear with me for two minutes. Okay, members, um, upon consultation, I was looking at the number of speakers, etc., that we have uh, lined up. <laughs> Clearly, we we're never going to get through them all today uh, in light of the length it's taken to get through the first two. Um, members, uh, I'm proposing now that we take number five uh, on the list uh, because there's one agent who wishes to speak to that. It's an approval. Uh, when we heard that one through, um, then uh, I, I, by virtue of the protocol of the planning committee, will we'll, we'll draw the, the meeting to a close. So it may be six quarter past six or thereabouts, taking in the break. That would be okay. Uh, can I also, before we do that, um, thank, but also apologize to all of those other speakers um, who went so patiently this afternoon. Um, the, as I'm sure many of you, particularly those who are your agents, who are regularly here in front of the planning committee, you, you will know this. This committee um, uh, uh, can be very, very fluid, and we actually don't know how long any particular application is going to be. Uh, and so, therefore, sometimes we're reluctant to, tr to let people go who may be sitting at number seven or number eight in the agenda because um, uh, you just never know. Uh, so, apologies to those of you uh, who waited so patiently today uh, to speak. Um, however, uh, I invite you all to come back same time tomorrow uh, and the appropriate links, etc. If they haven't uh, already been sent, you will be sent out to uh, you to join the meeting again tomorrow at two o'clock. However, can I ask uh, Mr. Lockery? I'm looking for the piece of paper with all the agents' names on it. Of course, there's not many here. Um, can I ask Eamon Lockery to hang on because uh, you're next? Uh, and Jim, uh, Jim Manili and Kyle Reilly, if you guys could hang on. But if everybody else, if uh, you're welcome to stay on our meeting if you want to, but uh, uh, we're not going to get to anybody beyond um, item number five on uh, decisions today. So again, uh, we're, uh, we'll get the ball rolling again. Okay, just give us a second.
Okay, members, so the next item on the agenda is uh, LA 11 2021 forward slash F. Uh, it is an approval. Um, uh, as you'll see from your packs, uh, Rosie's going to present for us. Um, uh, and then, as I said, we've got a, we've got a, a, a few people on behalf of the applicant to, to hear from. Um, so uh, take it away, Rosie. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Item 5, LA 11 2021 0121F is a proposal for a three, four and five storey residential development for 63 apartments at um, the former Longs Farm Shop and Petrol Station at 4 Letterkenny Road with a recommendation to approve. So this is just the site application map um, and members may, be, may remember that there was a previous approval before them under J2007-0672 for a similar form of development. But um, there is a sewer running through the site, if you can just see where the mouse is there, that pink line. And to keep outside the way leave of that sewer, the um, development site, the, the configuration of the layout of the, the units on site has been reconfigured. Um, for block C and block B. So the image on the left here, or the right, sorry, is the current proposed layout. In terms of consultees, um, in general, there's no objection from any of the consultees, but we are awaiting a response from NI Water, and I'll get to that later in the report. There have been two objections received from occupants of dwellings at Kosh Owen, and this is just a summary of the um, objections received. There's severe flooding on Foyle Road and Kosh Owen because the sewer system can't cope. Um, the form of the development is inappropriate for the area. Traffic congestion, there's previous approval on the site wasn't commenced, but as I've just alluded to there, that is um, partly because of the sewer going through the site and um, the requirement for a new application. I should have just said earlier too that another reason for this new application is that 10 more apartments have been proposed under this current application. Um, the residents or the objectors were also concerned that uh, Kosh Owen has won environmental awards for upkeep of the area, but officers don't consider that the development proposed would um, impact detrimentally on the character of the area. And the, the objectors advise that not all uh, uh, residents in the area were notified and not everyone has access to internet to view the plans. So. Um, only the or in respect of that, only the neighbours who abut the site or um, or abut the red line are neighbour notified. But the application is advertised in both the Dairy Journal and the Sentinel. Um, and if anyone can't view plans on the internet, they they do have the option to view the plans in our office or to contact the office and advise if they can't attend the office. Then I know um, hard copy plans are often sent out. Um, so this is just in terms of the context of the site. Um, that's the, the site with the former Maxwell Station canopy. That's still in place. Um, it's a residential, predominantly residential area where there's, um, this is the site here. And there's dwellings here at Kosh Owen and across the road at Glendara and Glen Ann. Um, we have this apartment block abutting the site with another further on down at Old City Court. Um, and just to the rear of this, this site here, the um, abutting the application site, there's currently um, an a, a apartment development under construction. Um, the site is also in proximity to a pumping station at this location and the Daisy Fields playing parks at this location. So in terms of the development itself, as I say, it's laid out in three blocks. And these 3D images just give an indication of uh, the proposed appearance of the site. So this is block B fronting onto Foil Road, and this is block A. Um, block C then is seen at this point, looking, that's looking onto the River Foil. And again, this is block C, block B at this location, and block A. Um, these um, images just to give a wee bit more uh, detail on the proposal. So this is block A fronting on to Letterkenny Road. There's 21 apartments are proposed in this uh, block, which is more one more than was approved under the 2007 application. And this development is predominantly four storeys in height, dropping to three storeys at this uh, point. So it's largely um, so in the same footprint as previously appro uh, uh, proposed under the former approval as well. Uh, block B, or sorry, yep, yeah, Block B then is um, also fronting on to Foyle Road, and it's it's a four-storey block stepping down to two storeys at the rear. 
and Block C fronts on to the river. Um, and also looks as a it's a double frontage building looking internally into the site as well. Um, so the variation that, that the applicant is proposing in terms of the roof heights has the overall effect of lessening the mass of the development. And it's further broken up then by uh, the different um, mix of materials and bringing elements of the uh, building forward and pushing other elements back. So there's a very contemporary mix of masonry, glazing, um, standing seam aluminium, and the balconies then have uh, glass balustrades. Um, objectors to the development consider that it's not an appropriate type of housing for the area. I offer officers have considered that the proposed apartment development, which is itself residential in nature and is set in the context of existing residential apartments and dwellings, is appropriate for the area. And officers um, consider that it complies with policy QD1 of PPS7 in terms of its layout, scale and massing. Um, that the design and external appearance of the apartments are of a contemporary high quality design which is acceptable to the in the location um, we've also given consideration to overlooking and any potential for loss of light but consider that the separation distances between the existing and approved development and the orientation of the building on site um, coupled with the massing which has been carefully considered um, we don't think that there will be any detrimental impact on residential amenity. There have been some design amendments proposed to protect amenity. For example, here um, on this, uh, the western block of, of, of or the west, western elevation of block C, um, we were concerned with overlooking onto proposed new dwellings, or dwellings are actually under construction on the adjacent site. So these um, glazed elements are going to be um, obscure glass. Um, also, it was stepped down. The development was stepped down at this location to prevent overlooking from a, um, sorry, to prevent over our dominance. And a proposed uh, roof area was moved to the other side of the the development um, onto the eastern elevation to prevent overlooking. Um, in terms of open space provision, um, because there's 63 apartments proposed, communal open space is required, and this takes the form of communal grassed areas, landscaped areas, and uh, two plazas with seating. There's a more extensive area of uh, open space here to the south, which um, incorporates three play areas, um, and there are also communal rooftop terraces. Um, officers are satisfied that the development provides at least 10% of open space. Um, which is in a, a parts of the site that are easily accessible and that are um, of use to both families and individuals. There's private amenity space proposed in terms of front gardens and balconies. Um, and given the amount of communal open space proposed, officers are satisfied that um, there's sufficient private and communal open space within the development. Um, in terms of access and movement, provision is made for new vehicular access at this point of the site. And it's on to Letter Kenny Road, which is a protected route. So as this application proposes 10 dwellings more than the previous approval, the issue of intensification was considered. DFI roads consider that um, it's acceptable and conditions have been provided in terms of just improving the, the visibility onto Letter Kenny Road. So objectors also considered that the development would lead to congestion in the area. However, a traffic impact a traffic assessment form was submitted with the application, and it advises that when it was operational, the petrol filling station attracted a daily average of 530 vehicles. So this would be um, significantly reduced um, under a residential development for 63 apartments. So officers are satisfied that it's unlikely that the development will result in congestion in the area. In terms of parking, a total of 86 spaces are proposed, which is just below the required 89 spaces. Um, this slide just shows that there's 65 spaces provided in a basement level car park, car park under Block C, and a further 21 spaces are provided on a surface level car parking. Um, so the shortfall of spa um, three spaces isn't considered um, significant and adequate parking is considered to be proposed. Furthermore, the site is accessible to the city by walking and cycling and 36 cycle spaces are provided within the basement level car park. There's three bus stops within 400 metres of the site providing 14 bus services with the closest bus service across the road in Letterkenny Road. So officers consider that PPS3 um, is met. In terms of natural heritage, NIEA Natural Environment Division and Shared Environmental Services consider the impacts of the proposal on designated sites and other natural heritage interests and on the basis of the information provided have no concerns. 
Um, in terms then of uh, flood risk, the strategic flood map indicates that the development doesn't lie within the 1 in 100 or the 1 in 200 year coastal floodplain, and it's not at risk from surface water flooding due to um, at present or due to climate change. This map um, is taken from, it's the DFI river flood map, and what it's shown there is this is the river and this is the site. So it shows that th this is the map showing the 1 in 100 or the 1 in 200 coastal floodplain, so it doesn't impact the site. Now, the pink area does relate to surface water flooding, but it is mainly confined there to the to out to onto the Le the Letterkenny Road at this point. So the application site itself isn't um, impacted by surface water flooding. Um, because the application proposes 63 apartments, um, a drainage assessment was required. Um, and it details that it's proposed to deal with drainage from the site by discharge to um, a Northern Ireland water storm sewer, which is located on the Foyle Road. This is just, I'm sorry, that's a wee bit blurred, but it's the drainage, the green lines show um, the, the drainage to the Northern Ireland network there. Um, so it's proposed that the site will drain into that. And it's, it states that the design is ensures that during a one in 30 year storm event, that the Northern Ireland water system will contain the volumes of water which are generated. And DFI Rivers advises that the drainage construction of a suitable drainage network is feasible. Um, there'll be further assessment by NI Water prior to adoption. And there's a condition regarding the requisition of the surface uh, sewer. The drainage assessment goes on to consider the one in 100 year storm event and it's proposed that a section of green space or an offline storage area within the green space within the development would be used for storage. So that during a one in 100 year event, when the water reaches a set level, it'll flow through over, um, overflow pipes and discharge into this area here. And once the, that storm event would have passed and water levels start to drop, the water then would return back into the Northern Ireland uh, storm sewer system. So officers are satisfied that subject to a condition requiring detailed design of the offline storage, that it is possible to provide adequate measures to effectively mitigate flood risk to the proposed development and from the development elsewhere. So the requirements of PPS 15 um, are met. Now, I apologise because in the report that condition is not stated. So the wording of the condition we're just proposing here for agreement of members, which would read, no development shall commence on site until a drainage report has been submitted, submitted to and approved in writing by the planning authority to demonstrate how any out of sewer flooding emanating from the surface water drainage network in a one in 100 year event will be safely managed so as not to create flood risk to the development or from the development elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> just going to go on here now to the fact that this the site is um, it sits beside an existing uh, pumping station um, and it was necessary to have an odour dispersal modelling report carried out. Now, NI Water advised that because of the proximity to the pumping station, there's the possibility of um, odour and noise. Um, the odour dispersion model was also con was considered by Environmental Health and is still under consideration by NI Water. Um, now, officers do acknowledge that there is the possibility of um, occasional odour to be experienced by you know the future occupants of the apartments. But we've taken into account the responses from environmental health regarding the find, findings of the odour dispersal model, which predicts that odour concentrations will be negligible at the nearest apartment block. That would be block B. Um, officers consider that it's likely that any odour experienced won't cause demonstrable harm or unacceptably affect amenities of future occupants. So, um, as I say, NI Water continue to consider the report and officers have progressed the application today on the basis that if we receive um, a response from NI Water, which doesn't raise any um, you know, concerns or issues, that we will proceed to issue the, the application. Otherwise, if there's any substantive or significant objections, then we would return the application to uh, the planning committee. Um, just in respect of sewage, NI Water um, advised that there's um, adequate capacity in the foul sewer at the location, which discharges into the Colmore Wastewater Treatment Plant. And just to advise members that there 
is the potential for contamination on the site given its previous use as a filling station um, and the previous conditions that were applied to the earlier 2007 application are being restated for the current application. So um, approval is recommended, members, subject to the conditions set out in the report. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rosie, for the report. Um, members, as I um, indicated on um, <clears throat> online with us here, we have Eamon uh, Locri, Jim Manili, and Cal O'Reilly, um, all on behalf of the applicant. Gentlemen, uh, you're very welcome. Thanks for uh, joining us. Um, and thanks for your patience as well, in relation to sticking your way through other applications. Um, so uh, I'm uh, not going to delay any further. Uh, I invite you now to present to the committee. Um, Cahill Riley of Clarman Architects. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think uh, just given the relative um, um, nature of the very, uh, there doesn't appear to be very many issues with regard to our proposal. As uh, Rosemary uh, alluded to, we're confident that it's a high quality design. Um, should there be any issues or should any members of the council have any queries, I'm happy to address them with regard um, to the design. Uh, Eamon um, can address any issues with regard to planning policy that you may have. But other than that, um, it just remains for me to thank the, the planning officers for their input thus far. Um, any critique of the scheme um, was constructive, and um, I'd like to think that we're anticipating a relatively positive outcome. Thank you, Cal. Uh, thanks for keeping it brief. Um, however, uh, please stay with us, um, because I'm going to open it up to the floor now to afford uh, members an opportunity to ask any questions that they might have for you. So anybody? Councillor Logue, yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Kethel. Um, and DG are correct to say that the plan report um, didn't raise um, any issues, but I'm, I'm afraid I, I, I do have some uh, concerns. Um, on a number uh, of points regarding this development. Now, that's not to say this has been a vacant uh, space for many years now, and it would be fair to say that the, the local community um, would uh, prefer to, to have it developed, as would I. Um, However, I do note at the start of the presentation on the community involvement, the notice of community involvement was uh, lodged in the paper of, for the, I think it was the 20th November 2020, which we were obviously, I know we were in the middle or just starting the, the, the pandemic and the, the, the lockdown, etc. Um, but it was um, an online virtual event on the 9th of December, and there was no involvement at all, um, which for me, uh, you know, is unacceptable. There is a good community infrastructure within um that area so um just putting it within a newspaper that many many people uh no longer purchase and having it online and i do realize that we were in a pandemic and no matter what way it would <clears throat> it would have been online however there is community infrastructure uh, organizations um within the area that I feel you could have reached out to to help with that uh, community involvement. And given the lack or the no participation, excuse me. I, I would prefer if there if that um, was was carried out again, even though I know this is on uh, for decision again. Um, or, or at the moment, 
So I suppose, um, and also given the, the need for housing uh, within this council district, um, developments of, of any nature are welcomed. However, we have to be mindful of the actual need within this council district. And there's over 4,000 um, applicants in the uh, housing executive register looking for uh, who are in housing stress. Um, this is a private development, so I would imagine that that will go nowhere to touch uh, the, the the need uh, within that uh, the housing executive um, register. Nevertheless, you know uh, there will be people who will be looking for uh, private. Uh, private renting, um, but I think because it's all apartments, there, there's not a mix of tenure within this application, so I, I would certainly have concerns about that. Um, the next thing uh, I, I want to talk about is the overlooking and the, the, the suggestion that glazed glass will be uh, installed where overlooking, um, you know, uh, might be an issue for uh, adjacent um, adjacent um, residential areas. However, glazed glass for me uh, within a within an apartment will have a detrimental impact on the person that's going to live in that apartment. Um, it might solve the problem of the overlooking at the other residence, but certainly if you're sitting in your living room with a um, or a bedroom with a glazed window, I, I don't think that's a very, um, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't be looking for an apartment of, of that nature. The open space, I have, uh, I have um, a question uh, regarding the open space. Um, it is above the, the what has what has been required. However, can you tell me, give me a breakdown of what percentage of that open space is rooftop open space? And again, I. I certainly, you know, would have concerns about the, the usage of roof, rooftop open space. Um, but uh, I would like the, the percentage of how that breaks down with the overall, um, the overall uh, figure. Regarding the, the congestion, the Maxwell filling station has been closed for years. I love about 10 minutes walking uh, distance from this area. And I know there was a farm shop, but the actual Maxwell filling station has been closed for years. And I would doubt very, very much if the 530 cars, which was mentioned in the report, um, travelled in and out through that filling station. I, I just would have great. Uh, I just don't agree with that figure at all. Um, the congestion that is a very busy road. You, this is a road leading onto you've the Letter County Road leading onto Foy Road. It's a it's a three way to the 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 city, and it is. Uh, the, I note the bus stop is on the other side of the road, as is much of the amenities such as parks, uh, the statement, or the, the stadium, community centres, etc. So I would have great concern about uh, road safety. I do know that the roads at the moment are carrying out a traffic impact assessment at my request. Uh, and that is without the, the these these apartments being built. Um, so I do have concerns around the the congestion, um, flooding, which I suppose is, is the main thing. Look, 
while it mightn't be on these maps, for me, flooding is flooding. Letter County Road was mentioned that that was the main flooding area. That is not correct. Caution floods, Old City Court floods, Old City uh, Close floods, Letter County Road floods, Foil Road floods, and Street flood floods. And these are all directly uh, surrounding this area. And I don't mean it's just once in a, a, a huge, uh, when there's a big storm. These areas could flood at a, at a heavy rain. Uh, and in fact, they flooded last Sunday. Last Sunday was the last time they flooded. And, um, you know, it's just not true that there is no issue with flooding in this area. That, that road could flood and those other areas could flood four or five times uh, a year. And indeed, houses have actually... Councillor Logue, I'm sorry to interrupt you. And I know I understand that all of the, the matters that you're raising are important matters. Um, but this was for questions to the applicant. And some of what you're stating here would probably be better directed to our officers right. because it's their report that you're and, referencing. And just, you know. that, that, wasn't um, so, that wasn't a question. It was just a concern right. that well, I had. Councillor I'm very conscious, obviously, of the time of is, and I don't want to rush this either. No. Uh, but at the same time, can we put the questions to the uh, applicants? Right. Well, I suppose... Uh, because there are an awful lot of things that you're mentioning there which clearly are important, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't disagree with much of what you're saying. But the the questions need to be more directed for the applicant. We can come back to a lot of that with the officers, because actually the officers are the people who prepared the report, as you know. OK, well, are you aware of the, the amount of flooding uh, within the area? I don't ask for the percentage of uh, open space, um, the rooftop open space regarding and the, the ground open space. Uh, you could break down that percentage. Um, the glazed gla glass, do you not see that as a concern? And the community involvement uh, statement, um, do you think more work could have been done on that? And what do you intend to do going forward? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Logue. Um... Yeah, I'm sorry to cut across you, but I don't, I'm not sure the applicant can, can answer enough, all of those questions either. But go ahead, gentlemen. You're going to attempt to answer some of them, I'm sure. Yes, Chair. Um, I'll do my very best. Thank you, Councillor Logue. Um, just if, if, if I take the points in turn, um, in relation to the advertising, you're quite right. The, the project was advertised in the local papers, but due to COVID restrictions, um, our, our, the, our, our scheme um was uh, put on display via um microsoft teams uh and interested parties were invited um to partake we had no feedback with regard to that um but to all intents and purposes um we did our level best to follow the 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 the, uh, the present guidelines with regard to protocol at the time um subsequent to that um Councillor Logue, I know, um, I think it was last year, some councillors contacted us directly expressing queries with regard to the scheme and expressing more details uh, or, or the wish to get more detail on the scheme. And we certainly did engage with the councillors um, and addressed any queries um, that were um, mentioned at that time, particularly in relation to density and how we were able to um, increase the density by 10 units. Um, with no significant impact or detriment to the quality of the scheme. So we did our best there. In, in relation to the housing and the policy mix, I mean, our brief was to um, revise the previous approval and upgrade the quality of the design. Um, so fundamentally, um, our design strived to achieve a high quality residential design, um, irrespective of the end user, whether that be social housing or otherwise. Um, with regard to the specifics and residential policy, I might prefer at the end of my answer to your questions to Eamon, who, who will happily interject. 
um, I hope in relation to that particular element of residential um, design policy. Now, in relation to the overlooking, there is perhaps a, a slight misunderstanding. We have um, on the western elevation of Block C, we have employed glazing which is transparent but translucent on one elevation only. Um, all of the apartments locating, located on that end elevation are dual frontage. Uh, in that not only do they have a westerly aspect, but they have an aspect to the north and to the south as well. So their views are very much directed inwardly to the development to the north and outward across the playing phase to the south, thereby presenting no issues with regard to privacy. Um, their aspect to the western frontage is solely to capture light, but to not um, to not present any any issues with regard to loss of privacy or overlooking. So we're confident that that is the very very best solution that could be achieved. Now, um, your other question in relation to the provision of open space, the provision of open space, as clarified in all our documentation and indeed clarified to the planning officer is 20% of the site area or approximately 20% of the site area, which as uh, Rosemary pointed out, exceeds the 10% which is required under policy. The percentage of rooftop space is actually over and above that. Um, it's not included in that figure. So if it were counted, it would bring the percentage of amenity space well in excess of the 10% required. Um, I don't have the figures to hand as to the actual area of the rooftop open space, but I would suspect it will probably add another 10% of the site area, perhaps as much as 15. Um, in relation to road safety, we engaged in extensive, um, extensively with DFI roads to address any issues that they would have. We've provided ample car parking within the site. We've adopted measures whereby uh, vehicles to and from the site will be calmed down by means of um, a pedestrian crossing on the entrance to the site. Uh, we've achieved the required visibility displays and provided pedestrian crossing points as well across the mouth of the main vehicular entrance. So we're confident that we've done our level best in order to address all concerns that the statutory body had in relation to that. In relation to flooding, um, I mean, Rivers Agency have assessed our drainage assessment and are quite content with, with the outcome. Um, they have requested or we have included offline storage to deal with the one in 100 year event. And as Rosemary has alluded to, there is certainly anecdotal evidence of the Letterkenny Road flooding, but that lies without, outside the confines of our site. Um, and I would suspect it's perhaps a maintenance issue with the council. We can't really um, solve problems which lie outside the site. We can only deal with stuff or items and design issues that pertain to our site. And we're quite confident that we've satisfied that issue as well. Um, so I hope that answers your questions. Happy to address any more that you might have. I might just ask Eamon to step in with regard to housing policy, if at all possible. Yeah, thank thank you, Carl. I have I have three very very basic points just to add to that. Um, and what the first one is on the consultation exercise, um, and that was carried out in accordance with the guidelines that the uh, DFI issued um, at the start of the pandemic. Um, and it, uh, uh, no one really knew how the pandemic would pan out when you were in the throes of it. And that was uh, that was the consultation was carried out in accordance with the 
both the legislative changes and the guidelines. But in addition, just to add to that, um, whenever you do a public consultation, you're, you're required to note on your documentation that the, that the comments made as part of the public consultation are only comments made to the applicant and not to the council, and that the council will, of course, never notify and advertise the application. And so people would have had the second bite at the cherry to make their representation more forcefully if they had it to the council as part of the planning application process and not just to the developer as part of the pre-application consultation exercise. Um, second point, uh, two points on, on residential. Um, the, uh, the residential mix, now the character of the area is apartments either side of this uh, development um, and there's new apartments in, in of course being built and the history of the site is apartments. And so the applicant is required to design a scheme that is consistent with the character and have regard to its planning history. And so the character was all, would, would always be apartments on this site. And in terms of the, the mix, well, PPS 7 addendum provides the requirements for the size and type of house uh, of apartments. And the application is consistent with uh, Appendix A of PPS 7 in terms of the, 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 the size of the apartments being provided. So we are satisfied that the, uh, the, the scheme uh, does meet uh, planning policy in terms of residential development. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, bear with me, Commissioner McKinney, just a second. There's somebody else in the chat box in front of you. Okay. Thanks, gentlemen. Um, uh, Councillor Dobbins, um, bear with me again. Sorry, Councillor Dobbins, you're going to direct that now to, to the officer. Okay, that's fine. Um, go ahead, Councillor McKinney. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's just, just a really quick one. Um, is there not systems that builders can install to actually help with the flood fences, as in tanks can be fitted? Uh, below ground to take on the water, subsequent water is overflowing. If our own uh, day five flood defences aren't working, and surely this would maybe alleviate the problem of those flats uh, flooding. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor McKinney. I was actually mothering there. I think I saw that in the report, but I'll let these gentlemen answer it as well. Shall I answer that, Chair? Um, ever feels best able to answer, yeah. I suppose. Um, I mean, it, it, it's a very valid point. Um, but as I said, um, you're quite right. Builders can install various mechanisms whereby um, the discharge emanating from a storm event can be stored or can be um, a, a smoothed out or lessened and as 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 we said to the um south i think it's the southwest or sorry southeast corner of our site we have an offline storage system which will cater for a one in 100 storm event um elsewhere in the site in the plaza area which lies between blocks a and c and indeed b that triangular shape um we have um, permeable paving, uh, which will reduce the flow of surface runoff, which emanates from a storm event, and will discharge to that area offline in the event that the capacity of the public system is exceeded. So certainly, um, Councillor McKinney, we have adopted all of those very latest technologies which are employed by builders um, to to cater for such an event that may occur uh, within the 100 year storm um, criteria okay thank you for that um i don't see any other questions for you gentlemen just just um 
Councillor Oga, go ahead, but please try and keep it brief. Yep, just two more questions. Uh, what provision is, is going to be there for the drying of clothes? And also, what provision is going to be there for waste disposal? Go ahead. I can answer that one. Um, all of our apartments um, exceed the spatial standards as required in terms of policy guidelines. Um, they're amply served by large kitchens, which will all have condensing tumble dryers. Um, so, and there was also an area in our basement, ample area in the basement, to uh, provide um, communal drying facilities communal laundry facilities should they be required but that that particular uh, element of our design will be addressed at detailed design stage um, in relation to waste disposal we have ample um, bin storage um, provision um, located along the western boundary of our site um, and Unlike the previous proposal, we have pulled it back from the street so that it is suitably concealed and it's amply accessed by the vehicular um, access located to the north um, east of, of, of the site. And it's all screened by low walls, planting and uh, vented gates. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, thanks, Commissioner Oak. Who are members? Uh, okay. Uh, Councillor Dobbins, I'm, I'm, not, I'm still conscious you're there. Don't panic. Gentlemen, I just, uh, again, it's not a question and, and really not too much of a statement, but yes, I, I concur with Councillor Oak. There are big concerns about flooding in this particular part of the, of the city. Um, uh, and that's something, again, I personally want to, um, explore with our officer. Um, I mean, you have a proposal here for an underground car park. I'm actually wondering about the wisdom of that, you know, because Councillor Logue's not wrong. She and I and other elected representatives have had many reasons to visit these particular areas. And the flood map, okay, it says the flooding's on the Letterkenny Road, but water runs everywhere whenever it's running. Uh, and it's coming in this guy and stair rods. But anyway, that's just an observation. I don't expect uh, you to give me an answer on that because say I'm going to direct that to, to our officers. Um, so we're done with these gentlemen. Just stick around. Um, uh, and again, now, Councillor Dobbins, um, you have a question for Rosie. Yeah, I do. And I never panic, John. Thank you. Um, Rosie, it is... Very well. I'm, I'm just going to reiterate some of the things that were said there, um, but the questions to yourself as the planning officer. It is very well documented about the flooding in that area. And whilst the applicant sort of alluded that it was, um, this has to do with council, council has nothing whatsoever to do with it. Um, that uh, DFA and it's more department departmental issue, but, um, and it doesn't take heavy thunder plumps or uh, prolonged uh, heavy rain to create these floods. Just a simple hour or two of ordinary rain uh, creates an issue with flooding in that area. I myself had um, a, not rivers and DFI roads at a meeting last week where they were saying that the one to 100 year event no longer exists. And it's due to climate change, which has reduced the st statistic. And coupled that with the word sewage, I am really, really worried with regard to this. Uh, um, I would like to know the preventative measures because these flats are only adding into a, a pipeline uh, of already troubled um existence i would like to know what the preventative measures uh have are, are being put in place with regard to addresses i'm very disappointed about how aesthetically unappealing in my opinion these look and i would agree with councillor Logue that uh, a mixed development uh might have been better placed there 
a pretty amount of uh, the Roswell Street flats. And, um, you know, the people, even the people that lived in those flats couldn't wait until they were demolished. So um, I, I just don't see where that's coming from. Uh, and as for the other points that Councillor Logue had put to the the applicant, you know, there is no facility for ordinary living. Um, a tumble dryer in a kitchen, well, with the cost of electricity, it's hard enough to run even before the, this hike in the electricity costs. So, you know, how do we expect people to be living there? There has to be, as well as, um, uh, there has to be a quality of living, uh, Rosie, and, and, and I don't see it in this application, to be quite honest. Uh, the traffic congestion uh, um, in that road, that road is already a busy corridor from Donegal to Derry. Um, I, I do highlight, you know, that um, DFI roads, you know, have sort of made no no opinion on that. Uh, and and that is really worrying. Um, Rosie, I would just like that that addressed with regard to the sewage uh, and, and the preventative measures. Because listening to the applicants, in my opinion, it was just a tick box exercise on the application. Thank you. As Councillor Dobbins, I'm not sure I heard any questions on that. So, um, I asked about the preventative measures um, for yeah, but, to alleviate sewage um, flooding. Yep. Yeah, okay. Grand. Okay. Um, so, Rosie, that's one for you. Um, if you want to answer that. Thank you, Chair. Um, in respect of sewage, um, Councillor Dobbins, NIE Water have responded and advised that there is a sewer within 20 metres that can um, accommodate th this development and that there's sufficient capacity at the wastewater treatment works um, at Culmore to um, accept that. Um, the combined sewer that runs that was the that meant that um, the development had to be come back before members. You know, a new design was proposed, but the sewer that is on the foil road is a stormwater sewer. So, as I would understand it, that that's separate to the 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 sewage. Then the two won't go into that one sewer. And maybe that's something if we could bring in the applicant again. I don't know if they could confirm that. But the the drainage plan that we have before us has been assessed by DF Rivers. And they're satisfied that with requisition of a Northern Ireland water sewer to connect into the existing sewer on Foyle Road, so it would be an extension to connect into that sewer, that um, adequate, um, the, the sewer, or sorry, the stormwater sewer in a one in 30 year event could be accommodated within the existing, um, the existing sewerage system there, the stormwater sewer. What's proposed then, for a one in one hundred, or a, you know, one in one hundred year event, a, a bigger event, I suppose, is that the excess water would be accommodated within what's called here an offline attenuation system. It, in respect of that, DFI Rivers have suggested the condition, which, um, as I apologise for, was omitted from the report, which would require the detail of how that excess water would then be accommodated. So we still, to, there are methods, there are means by which that can be achieved, and it's to get the detail on that that um, the condition is is uh, proposed. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Um, it does, uh, Rosie, and um, yeah, I would have. In, in all fairness, and I know it's, it's a blunder, just um, I would have liked that uh, report to be there included in front of me with the, from the FI about the excess water. Um, you had mentioned there that there would be an extension of the flooding pipe. It, there was no mention of sewage there, but it was the, the excess, the flooding pipe. Who's actually who's responsible for this then? Is that department or is that the developer? Uh, through the chair, that is um, NI Water. The the sewer would then be adopted by NI Water, and the the final details on that connection are will be agreed with NI Water. If I could just find it here, there is a condition. Um, yeah, no development shall proceed beyond subfloor construction until an extension to the existing surface water network to serve the development is provided. The applicant may requisition NI water um, for that purpose. 
efforts to ensure a practical solution to the disposal of surface water from the site. So that condition is condition 20 within the report. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Okay, thank you, Councillor Dobbins. Anybody else? Um, there's a couple of a couple of things Rosie jumped out at me in the report. Um, I, I think you know overall our experience of, of of flooding matters in this area does tell us that these sorts of events are happening much more often than one in a hundred years. I mean we we see that. Uh, in fact, in the very la last part of the severe flooding, one of the areas that you haven't heard much about in the media, because there were other areas that were that suffered very bad flooding as well, was actually this area of the Brandywell, uh, the Foyle Road, the Lecky Road. Um, you know, that's that's all not relevant to this in, a, in that sense, but I think it's important as part of the conversation that we bear in mind these things certainly do happen more than, more than once in 100 years and possibly now even these days more than once in 30 years, but that's not, you know, you, you, you're not sure as a rain. But there were a couple of aspects to your report as well that did, of course, give me um, some degree of comfort and that. 12.35 officers on balance are content to progress the application to committee ahead of a response from Northern Ireland Water. Uh, and in the event, um, paraphrasing it, uh, that response comes back uh, and it doesn't meet satisfaction that that will come back to this committee again. Uh, I would contend uh, that that needs to come back to this committee again anyway. Um, because Northern Ireland Water are very important in the whole part of the story. Bear with me, bear with me, because Councillor Gallagher wants to come in and ask a question. And, and look, if I'm wrong, then correct me, feel free to do so. Look, uh, we all want to see housing development, whether it be public housing, private housing, a mixture of both. But the last thing we want to do uh, is to see people then moving into these premises and finding, for example, in a, in a basement car park if their cars are underwater. So that's why all, this is all very important. Bear with me, as I said. Um, actually, you know what? I think I'll let Rosie answer that now, Councillor Gallagher, and then we'll come back. Go ahead, Rosie. Thank you, Chair. Excuse me. Thank you, Chair. It's only in a matter of clarification for the reason that we we have suggested returning the application. That's in relation to the potential for odour emanating from the pumping station beside the site, because they're currently considering an odour dispersion modelling report. Um, and was um, the reason we progressed to committee was because, you know, Environmental Health have also considered the report and they're advised they're, it looks like there's negligible impact. But NI Water wanted to be certain that there were some aspects of the modelling that they wanted to check with the applicant um, and that uh, it, it just hasn't been completely bottomed out yet. Thank you for clearing that up for me. And you're absolutely right. Uh, it's been a long day. And I actually do specifically remember reading that part of the report. I just confused it in my head. Um, uh, go ahead, Councillor Gallagher. Well, thank you very much, Chair. <laughs> no, I look, I, I just, on this, uh, observations as such, I, uh, you know, on, on, on this development and just from memory, uh, not too far from this, we recently approved a, a, a very similar blocking project down, down towards the, the bridge end. Uh, it's the same stretch of road. So, and that's the same corridor that, uh, if my memory serves me right, there was a very positive uh, outlook to that development. And I think that this development, looking at it, uh, will complement uh, that corridor in the sense of if you're driving out of that corridor, the dereliction is there. And I think there is currently a development going on there now as we speak that again will further develop that corridor that will look a developed uh, city, you want to call it, uh, that's saying this is a corridor. The whole stretch from there and the, right on the city is going to be a developed Silly, that is an area previously, maybe currently, of high deprivation that may bring some prosperity to the area. 
You talk to them, one thirty, get them sorted, one hundred, get them looked at. I think that if we are going to look around developing, then that's the way forward of doing it. What's the precautions that you outlined here? And what's the caveat that this will come back and see what the proposal looks like with any water? So that's my observation. Thanks, Councillor Geller. I'm actually going through my report and trying to find something that I read earlier on. But um, earlier on last night, I um, can't seem to find it. It was. Hi. Uh, my memory's not that great, but remembering back to 2016 when we approved the 53. Um, uh, and now, we've, now we're being. Obviously, this is a new application with 10 extra additional apartments on it. Um, and at that time, again, some of the flooding events that we've witnessed hadn't happened, obviously. I mean, the most significant flooding events that we would remember in recent memory actually were in 2017 and then again this summer and stuff like that. But this area, as I said, has had. But there was some mention somewhere. Uh, there, I think that's... A one a twelve hundred millimeter diameter combined sewer cross along a southern portion of the site, however, and therefore resulted in the redesign of the scheme so the apartment blocks could be located beyond the confines of the way leave as specified specified by NA Water. It is also the case that Ter could you explain a little bit about what significance that might have for combined sewer? and street runoff, is that what that is? Thank you, Chair. The, the combined sewer is where you get both storm water and sewage going into the one pipe. As I understand it, they couldn't, the, the development couldn't be built over that sewer, so that's why it's been pushed back beyond the way leave. I'm not sure that there's any um, implications in terms of drainage through that. It, it's not that it would have, um, well, they're just not allowed build over it, um, but it, it, there's no other impact in terms of the drainage. So, so uh, the reason I ask that, and um, I promise this is my last question. So then bearing in mind that that very significant sewer is there in situ already, is there a proposal that the development here then would tie into that sewer system? It's actually going to tie into the, there's going to be oversized pipes provided from the site to the storm sewer that's existing on Foil Road. So it won't be tying into the combined sewer, as I understand it. It'll be tying into the existing sewer on the Foil Road. And that's why that condition uh, 20 is attached, that the applicant needs permission or needs agreement with NI Water to tie into that sewer. That's their requisition. And, a new extension to connect into that, sir. Um, and the finer details of that will be agreed with NI Water because they'll then be responsible for adopting that infrastructure. Again, as I understand it. That's okay. Right. All right. Anybody else? Yeah, me, John. Oh, yeah, Councillor Dobbins. Sorry about that. It's actually a question for yourself, Chair. Look, with regard that there seems to be um, <clears throat> a, a very huge question, and I think Councillor Gallagher brushed on it, there seems to be very a very huge question um, out there that needs to be answered. So can I ask, why are we today deciding upon this when that is a relevant um, and weighty uh, question that needs or report that needs to be um answered you know from northern ireland water um you know with regard to uh will they allow the pipes and like and the, don't get me wrong but the the pipe system in the foil road is not for, for purpose anyway and that's proven so um why are we deciding today upon this application i don't see why it's in front of us whenever there's such a weighty um question and 
um, report needed to come back, you know, and permission given, you know, before uh, could we not wait until that happens and then make this decision? Okay. Uh, I, hang on. Bear, who's that? It's Cahal here from Carmen Architects. If, no, if no I, Cal, 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 I've moved on from you. I'm sorry, but uh, I, 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 to be honest with you, I can't even, protocol doesn't even allow me to, I wish I could. It make life easier. Uh, however, uh, Councillor Dobbins, it's actually not a question I can answer. Um, Councillor Dobbins, I don't set the agenda and I don't decide what sits in front of us here today. However, I think officers would like to explain why it is that it's sitting here in front of us today. I, I, I can understand why you're asking the question. And much and all as I would love to set the agenda. Uh, you really wouldn't want me to be doing that. <laughs> So go I ahead. Think I think, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, sorry, sorry. I can't have any other extraneous when I'm speaking or anybody else is speaking. Andre, would you like to answer that question, please? Um, yes, through the chair. Um, just to provide maybe a wee bit of clarity, I suppose the, the drainage network, we have consulted with um, DFA Rivers and NI Water. Um, both have cleared the application with regards to the drainage assessment that has been submitted um, with the application. You can see the, the slide that we have up there. There is that is an existing sewer that is crossing the site. And that's so the yellow portion there is showing a way leave. And that is the reason why there has been an amendment and well, a, a new application submitted on the site so that the development is now pulled away from that way leave. Um, but on its own merits, this application has been assessed in relation to the drainage assessment and the capacity of the, the infrastructure um, around the site. Um, and NI Water and DFI Rivers have both cleared the application subject to conditions. Um, there is a separate process outside of planning that the applicant will have to go through, um, and it's an Article 161 with NI Water. So whenever they come to um, the connections and, and NI Works, the existing pipes are putting on sewers or oversized sewers and stuff like that, that is all part of um, a separate agreement that has to be done between the applicant and NI Water outside of the planning process. The, the thing that we are we have said with regards to clarification from NI Water, the only thing that they have raised as an outstanding matter at the minute is an odour dispers dispersal model um, and that's in relation to their wastewater pumping station which is adjacent to the site um, and they are just seeking clarification from the agent team with regards to an, uh, basically the disperse dispersion model that we have already received and we have consulted with AHD and we've consulted with NI Water. They have a couple of queries, but we are content as officers to progress the application because of the comments we have, because of what's in the report and because of the comments back from AHD who, AHD who have looked at the report. And basically they're saying there's negligible um, impacts, but that's specifically to do with odour and potential residential amenity. With regards to the NI Water and the drainage network and the capacity of the drainage network, NI Water are saying at this point in time they are content with that element of it, subject to conditions. DFI Rivers haven't raised any issues with regards to flooding on the site. Um, and the, the agents write it and saying that it is not up to their development or outside of on land outside of their control that they cannot solve current flooding in a wider area or a wider locality. So we, the only reason we mentioned about bringing the application back or, you know, even um, having maybe that as an issue is if whenever we get NI water back and we think that another response is imminent, is only if they raise a major concern or a significant issue with regard to the odour modelling that they're querying um, slight issues with, with the, the agent, but we don't think that that's going to be an issue. I hope that clarifies something. I, I think it does. I think it does. Um, okay. Um, and the Article 154 would be something that would address some of those other concerns going forward. 
as what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Right, members, if there's no other questions um, for observations or call them what you want, there's obviously a recommendation in front of you. The recommendation is to approve uh, LA 11 2021 0121F. So there you are. Over to you. Councillor Gallagher. Yeah, Chair, happy to propose the recommendation. Do I need a seconder? I'll second that, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Mooney, and seconded by Councillor Mooney. Okay, so the proposal from Councillor Gallagher, seconded by Councillor Mooney, is to um, accept the officer recommendation to approve. Okay, so I'm going to put it to the floor. Mara, would you like to uh, take the vote? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Okay, members, this is item five, and the proposal is to accept the officer's recommendation to approve. Alderman Alan Breslin. For. Thank you. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. For, Mara. Thank you. Alderman Drew Thompson. For, Mara. Thank you. Apologies for Jason Barr. Councillor Raymond Barr. For, Mara. Thank you. Councillor Boyle. Or. Thank you. Councillor Angela Dobbins. I love staying, Maura. Okay. No problem. Um, Councillor Paul Gallagher. Or. Um, Councillor Christopher Jackson. Or, Maura. Thanks, Christopher. Councillor Dan Kelly. Yeah. No, go on. Councillor Patricia Logue. Abstain. Okay. Councillor Kieran Maguire. Or Mara. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Philip McKinney. Abstain, Mara. Thank you. And Councillor Sean Mooney. Or. Thank you. Nine, four, and three abstentions. Okay, so for the record, uh, nine members for that, no members against that, and three abstentions. So, members, that concludes today's business. Obviously, we will be returning tomorrow. Thank you, everybody, for your endurance. Um, uh, and uh, we'll be back at two o'clock. But, Councillor Lowe, you want to? address the committee before we head off. I, I just want to uh, give my apologies for tomorrow. Yes, this is always a fear I have coming to, come to Thursday that we might start losing people. Uh, Councillor McKinney? Yeah, I'd like to offer my apologies for tomorrow as well. Thank you, Councillor McKinney. Uh, uh, you'll be online, Councillor Geller. That's great. Please, you'll be there. Uh, members, for all of those who uh, are still with us today, um, uh, can I thank everybody for their attendance, thank members for their endurance, and can I encourage as many of you as is possible to be uh, with us all again for uh, 2 p.m. tomorrow. Thanks a lot, folks, and uh, have a good evening.